This video is a compilation of previously uploaded episodes, which you can find individually on the channel. But if you're new to the channel or would like to watch them again, then here you go. Welcome back to another Reddit deep dive episode. But before we dive in, I want to ask you something. What if there was someone out there who kept a log of every single thing you did every minute of the day? I think that would be pretty creepy. Well, what if I told you that's exactly what happens every time you go online? Your internet provider like AT&T or Verizon is allowed to store logs of every website you've ever visited and can legally sell this data to anyone. That's why whenever I'm online, especially while investigating for these deep dives, I always use ExpressVPN. You see, ExpressVPN reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers. So, your internet provider can't see or log what you do online. You may be wondering, if I'm routing all my data through a VPN, then doesn't that mean the VPN can see what I'm doing and log my data instead? And you're right to think that. Many VPNs claim to have a no-log policy, but have been caught logging customer activity. That's why ExpressVPN is the only VPN I trust, because they use trusted server technology. They were the first major VPN provider to engineer all of their VPN servers to run in RAM. This makes it impossible for their VPN servers to store any data, including the logs of any ExpressVPN customer. And you don't have to take mine or ExpressVPN's word for it, because ExpressVPN is so confident in their no-logs claim that they've even had one of the biggest assurance firms, PwC, audit their technology. It's no wonder that CNET named ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. So stop letting people keep logs of what you do online and visit expressvpn.com slash coffin to find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free. I'm not kidding. Ever since my channel started growing, one of the first things I did was get a VPN and I've used it every day since. Our first story was posted onto the RBI sub by the user Blue Angel on January 17th of 2023. It goes like this. Stranger with a vendetta? Stalking? Trafficking? What is going on? It all started in 2019, when my dad's car registration was stolen in the middle of the night, after which, one strange event after another unfolded rapidly. For the past three years, my family and I have been finding cigarette butts on our property, close to the house. We figured it was teenagers sneaking out at night and finding somewhere to smoke illegally, but this was not the end of it. Last year, sometime during summer, my family and I noticed that someone has been stealing food out of our garage freezer. One or two frozen desserts would disappear periodically. Again, harmless kids. Or so we thought. In December of 2022, my family and I who were all upstairs on the second floor heard what we thought was my brother coming home from work. He ran halfway up the stairs, then turned around, ran back down the stairs and out through the garage door again. My mom and I distinctly remember hearing the rattle of keys as he ran through the house. We all headed downstairs because he wanted to know how his day at work was. At that moment, my dad got a call from an old friend who wanted to wish us a belated Merry Christmas. Since we hadn't heard from this friend in such a long time, we all intently listened in on the call and forgot about my brother, figuring he was just getting something out of his car. Well, 30 minutes passed by and my brother was nowhere to be seen. I looked at the clock in the kitchen and I immediately went to check the driveway to see if his car was there, but his car was not there. It finally hit me like a ton of bricks. He was never home. Whoever ran through the house moments before we came downstairs was not my brother. I checked his schedule which was hung on the refrigerator. He was still at work, and his shift would not be over until 10 p.m. According to the caller ID, it was 8.20 p.m. when we got the call from the family friend, and by the time we realized what had happened, it was already 8.47, the time I had seen on the kitchen clock. We did not call the police because we had figured that whoever was in the house was long gone. Recalling the event, I distinctly remember the thud of boots on our wood floors and the jingle of multiple keys as they looped through the house. This was enough to make us start using our alarm system more seriously and go out in the buddy system if we needed to take the dog out at night. For the next few weeks, nothing happened, so the buddy system stopped. We thought that this would be the worst of it, but it wasn't. A few nights ago, while enjoying family time, the family dog let out her warning bark. We thought she was just overreacting, but something told me to check out what was making her so upset. She relentlessly paced the entryway, periodically jumping on the living room couch to look out the front window, all while barking with her ridge up. I knew it was serious. I had never seen her so worked up. We can turn our Christmas lights on through the garage, 
And this is exactly what I asked my sister to do. I watched out the front window with the dog as the lights went on. The light from the Christmas lights illuminated a tall man with a black hoodie standing next to a bush just off our porch. I could only make out his shadow as he turned and sprinted across our front lawn. We have quite a bit of property and living in the rural area, there is not that much light. So he disappeared into the darkness. I could tell he was around six feet tall because on our porch we have a wind chime which he had been standing right next to. And judging from the fact that what seemed to be the top of his head met the bottom of that chime, he would have to be around or at six feet tall. I never saw his face, but now my family is worried that whoever he is may think I know who he is and try something. That something, no one is telling me what it is, but I can only guess. Maybe it seems excessive to be worried about a strange prowler feeling his identity is known, but the further you read, you may realize as I have that the concern is legitimate. So this was the last straw and we called the police. They patrolled the area, but found no one. My family and I suspected as much because the direction he ran was into a field directly across the street just behind a neighbor's house. After some discussion with the officer, my dad decided to get cameras installed in the following month and not too soon either. This morning, my sister took the dog out and since it wasn't dark, she went alone. Shortly after, she came back in the house and grabbed a medical glove from our first aid kit and ran outside. After a few minutes, she came back inside the house holding some purple clay-like substance. I helped her put it in a Ziploc bag, and upon closer inspection found that it smelled strongly of chemicals. Purple, clay-like, and chemical-smelling wad in the middle of our front yard. We called the police for the second time this week, and they collected it. Now we wait until they test it to see exactly what it is. Their standing suspicion at the moment is either soft bait rat poison or some other substance intended for our dog. If it is poison, or just a sticky substance either way, if she had ingested it, our dog would have been killed. So why steal a car registration, break into a house to steal nothing, stalk the property, and try to harm someone's dog? We have no enemies that we know of. Our family has very few and select friends. My father is a simple desk job kind of guy. My mom is a stay-at-home wife, and all my other siblings are just ordinary people with ordinary lives. Our neighborhood is quiet, and we have gotten to know a few of them, who are really great people. With a little reconnaissance, I found out from our neighbor who my family has befriended, and who has lived here practically his whole life, that no one fits the description of our prowler. The neighborhood has been quiet and calm, until we moved here, that is. No one else has been disturbed by a prowler on their properties. He found it strange that out of all the houses in the neighborhood, only ours has been having strange events. Is someone targeting us? What for? Why? What is going on? I did a search on soft bait rat poison and found this. Obviously, we haven't gotten any confirmation that this is the same stuff the OP found. But based off of what they told us, I would say that this rat poison fits the description. A user by the name of Princess Pinguina would comment this. My guess is someone is living on your property. Another user from a now deleted profile would also say this. You should get as much camera coverage as possible ASAP. And you should also look around in storage buildings, crawl spaces, attics, and etc. for signs of habitation. Hard to come up with specific ideas without knowing what you're working with, but there is a way to make entrances to crawl spaces show signs of being tampered with. By putting down flour across a shed doorway, for example, or a piece of tape on the side of your freezer to show it's been opened. It might help narrow down what this person is staying on your property, if they are. I'm sure you already are, but you should change your locks ASAP too, especially the garage. I'd also get a camera on the garage ASAP if you have to wait for other coverage, since it sounds like that's where this person is focusing. Edit. As far as poisoning the dog goes, it could very well be just a case of the dog keeps tipping them off to the fact that I'm here, which is inconvenient for me, so they're trying to harm her to keep their cover safe. Keep your dog supervised constantly, because if they're coming into your house, they might try to bribe her, and in this case it sounds like they'd poison the bribe. We had a neighbor when I was a kid who was stalking us very similar to this, but not living on our property. Cigarette butts, missing food, all that shit. We'd find his footprints where he was looking into our windows, and one of the first things he did was try to bribe our dog. We were lucky he loved dogs, or would rather win it over than harm it. But make no mistake, that someone in this situation is going to be very keen on shutting your dog up, one way or another. The OP did give us three updates, with the first two being on January 22nd, only five days after the OP first posted, 
and January 23rd. Update, January 22nd. Friday night, the creep stood right under the newly installed camera that's facing the driveway, whistling into the mic helplessly devoted to you from Greece, specifically the refrain section, added to clear things up for some people. There is no recording of this on our camera, as it does not record sound as an event. We heard something fall on the back deck, and none of us were going to go downstairs to look out the kitchen window onto the deck. So we went to the live feed of the garage last driveway camera, and that is when we heard the whistling, which lasted a few seconds then stopped. We looked out the window on the second floor which faces the driveway, and we couldn't see anyone. But the next morning we did see boot prints in the mulch. My family and I are officially freaked out. After making a call to the police department, they said that because there is not visual evidence to go by, they are going to do nothing. They are treating us like we're too much, because we have reported everything that has been happening over the past two weeks to them, and evidently, they seem annoyed by it. Pretty much, my family and I are on our own, until we get tangible evidence of the creep. Update, January 23rd. My brother who is living with us currently, had his car inspected a little over a month ago, and at which time it passed inspection. Today his car radio caught on fire while driving. Does this have anything to do with the creep? Maybe, maybe not. There wasn't much activity on this post after these updates were added, until March 16th, about two months later. Hopefully the last update ever to be made on this, March 16th, 2023. We got all sides of the house covered with cameras. There are no more blind spots. Side note, while the technician was installing the cameras and sensors on the lower floor windows and doors, he brought to our attention that someone had tried to pry open our window on the first floor with a flathead screwdriver. Not at all disturbing. Anyways, since we got the last camera set up, we noticed that a particular male who used to walk and drive around our neighborhood has stopped coming around. Checking with our neighbors, this individual is not from the area. Me and my family have a feeling that this guy could have been the creep since coincidentally, he stopped coming around after the last camera went up, and with his absence from the neighborhood, everything has been peaceful. Now the question that remains is, who is he, and why was he harassing us? Okay, so there is one last update on this edit, but it is from June of 2023. And in April, the OP made a separate post with more information on what has been happening to them and their family. So we're going to jump over to that post before going to this last one, to keep everything in chronological order. Brother left for work. He noticed that while pulling out of the driveway, his car sounded a little off, but he was running late. He ignored the sound and continued driving. My brother decided to check on his car when he got home after work. On his way home from work at around 3 in the afternoon, he noticed that the sound was now an audible scraping of metal from under his car. As soon as he pulled into our driveway, he looked under his car and found that the heat shield was hanging down. At first we thought that possibly corrosion could have caused the heat shield to become loose, but there was no signs of corrosion. Closer inspections showed that the heat shield had been pried away by force with some sort of tool. His car is always parked in the driveway where we had installed a camera, so naturally, we opened the Google Home app to see event history. The morning he left for work that day no event was recorded. For the first time in several months of having it installed, the camera did not record an event. Upon inspecting the camera, we found a single scratch in a perfect circle around the frame of the camera lens. Was it there all along? And we just noticed it? Possibly. Our speculation is that maybe someone had stood in the corner of the house, the only blind spot between our side yard and driveway cameras, and placed some sort of cap over the camera, or anything else that would prohibit the camera from recording a person in the driveway. And no, it didn't happen at work. My brother's company said there was nothing on the parking lot cameras. Edit. Since nobody seems to care about how my family feels about this, I will omit any human personal feelings and cut this as dry as possible. This section was about how stressful this is, but since the populace is convinced of some sort of mental illness propelling me into some sort of mania, I don't really see the need to expose any of our emotions to heartless conjectures. Let's continue. This is the first event that has happened since we have had all the cameras up. There was only one other event that was before we installed the backyard camera, and no, the event was not recorded. There was a male stranger who used to walk the neighborhood before we installed the cameras, which are visible from the street. We suspected it was him, since once the cameras went up, he was no longer walking the neighborhood. We have not captured this person on any video, and the only time that we are aware of that the cameras have not worked is on April 19th of 2023 at 5.30, when my brother left for work, and they did not record him leaving. This is the same day his car was vandalized. Coincidence? Possible. Someone is messing with us. 
Whether every event leading up to this is a result of that one person or coincidence, it is still stressful trying to up not everything. So please, stop asking for videos and stop calling BS on this. Because quite frankly, you have the right to an opinion, but it does not mean that your opinion is the truth. Just because you didn't hear a tree fall in the forest, doesn't mean it didn't happen. That is all I can say. I posted this with hopes that people would give me some insight or ideas of what to do, which a few have been very helpful, but this is not for entertainment. This is for the security and safety of my family. After this, we didn't hear of any activity from the OP. Before we get to the final update, I will say that the lack of video footage is kind of alarming. I'm not gonna outrightly say that this is fake, but a lot of the commenters do seem to believe this. The final update went like this. Update. He is a registered S offender who has a history of stalking. From 2015 to 2018, he lived with his mom a half block away from our old house on the other side of town. Evidently, I actually met him once when he was a teen, and my dad and I were picking up an armchair his mom was giving away. After our move here, he coincidentally moved across town too, and found out that we lived in a neighborhood close to him. That's when the stalking started. Police are finally handling this. Case closed. There are a few questions I still have, such as what was the purple substance? How was no video recorded at all? And why did it take the police so long? But if we do assume that this is all true, then at least the police did finally start working on this. And now, hopefully the OP and their family can move on. As for the legitimacy of all this, I'm still on the fence, but I am curious to hear what you think. So let me know down in the comments. I will say this about stalkers though. From what I've learned about them, some are very patient, very sneaky, and are able to avoid detection for very long periods of time. Sometimes the victim doesn't even know until it's already been months, and even years in some cases that they're getting stalked, because for some of these people, it only takes a small interaction, and suddenly a new obsession blossoms. You just never know what links these stalkers will go through to get close to their victim. On February 4th of 2023, a Swedish Redditor by the name Donut Horse would come onto the RBI subreddit with a very concerning post. Someone is trying to kill dogs in my hometown. Hello, a little bit of background. I live in a town in Sweden with around 340,000 inhabitants. Since December of 2020 to today, we've had over 150 known attempts to hurt and kill dogs. The perpetrator in most cases deploys small baked bread buns containing sharp handmade stars made out of pieces of tin can. Sometimes the buns are dropped in plain sight, and sometimes near bushes or under leaves. Donut Horse included this picture of the bread traps, as well as this map of known attacks. Clearly someone, or some group, have been doing this for a long time. The green points are from 2020. The yellow points are from 2021. Orange for 2022. And red for 2023. Donut Horse also included this link to a Swedish website that was currently down, but thankfully somebody did capture it on the Wayback Machine. Despite it being fairly empty, we do have this section with information on what to do if your dog ingests something harmful. If an accident happens, if you suspect your dog ate something dangerous, contact your veterinarian immediately. If a dog eats a sharp object, you can feed it asparagus as it threads when digested. It can hopefully wrap around the foreign object and help passing it through the digestive system without causing harm. I think it's safe to say that the people in this city are pretty aware of the situation. The original post continues. Since 2021, a lot of dogs have ingested these buns, and at least four dogs have been rushed to the vet for operation, for stomachs filled with sharp objects. In other cases, meatballs containing nails, staples, or shards of glass have been found, the glass bottle kind. Since most of these cases slash rumors were circulating on Facebook, I took it upon myself to create a website regarding the case. I then spent countless of hours figuring out what brand of tin cans were used. These were quite common tin cans unfortunately, so this did not lead to anything. I then got a hold of police reports and started to enter all the information into Google Maps to try to get a good overview. In the picture of the map, you can see all the cases marked out. Yellow 2021, Orange 2022, and red, 2023. So the police have no leads whatsoever. There has not been a single sighting of this perpetrator. Best guess, 
is he is out doing this very late at night or early in the morning before people wake up. Now to my question for all of you. Have you ever had anything similar to this in your town? Or have you heard about similar cases somewhere? I have been Googling around for ages without finding anything helpful. I'm trying to find patterns, similarities, anything. All help would be very appreciated. In a later edit, the OP also included this image of a calendar with dates of known attacks marked on it. Does anyone else find it odd that there's a gap in the distribution of these buns on the map just west of Folkett's Park? I was just studying the same thing. Maybe too much criminal minds on my part, but my brain went immediately to the geographical profiling. I pulled up the map, zoomed into the center, and saw the same thing. Wouldn't be surprised if the perpetrator lived in the area. All the points radiate outward from that zone. My wife is in school for forensics, and I showed her the map. She said, I bet he lives near that park. So yeah, OP, that area might be a good place for a stakeout. Just watching for someone carrying bags of rolls. This is the empty spot on the map that the commenters are talking about. Maybe I also watch too much true crime. But if this is a single person, and they are out there trying to harm animals, then we could potentially have a future serial killer in the making. Usually these people begin harming animals, and eventually move up to hurting people as well. Hopefully that's not the case here, but regardless, whoever is doing this is sick. Ten days after the original post, the OP would come back with this update. First of all, I want to say thank you for all your comments and theories in my first post. I have gone through them all, and took a lot of great information and new insights from it. Now, what I didn't tell you in my first post is that the dog attacks are not the only crazy and strange thing that has been happening since 2020. Actually, we've had four different and very odd attacks going on in parallel to each other. Hitting glass shards in playgrounds, in the sand, under the swing sets, slides, etc. Arsons at playgrounds. Attacks on more than 250 trees with what I believe to be some kind of draw knife and attacks on dogs. I've made a picture marking out each individual known accident. I've also gone through all of the news I could find on these and marked out the dates and times. I also made a new map. This time, I decided to display the bread ball attacks only because that seems to be the most consistent modus. On this map, black is attack on dogs, red is attack on trees, yellow, hidden glass shards at playgrounds, and purple, arsons at playgrounds. One thing I noticed is this bike lane section. When I turned it on, it lit up this line of attacks featuring tree, bread, and glass incidents. Aside from the tree markings, the bread and glass attacks could be somewhat easy for someone to commit while riding a bike, tossing their traps as they casually ride. And again, even with the addition of all these incidents, the dead zone remains basically empty, almost like a big X on a treasure map. Just a thought. Now back to the post. My theory is that at least two of these are the same person. Dog attacks plus another. It seems to me like it's the same twisted mind planning these attacks. I am once again looking for a pattern. What I can see is that these incidents almost never occur on the same day. They sometimes end during the same period and start again roughly at the same time. Some of them happen if not exactly at the same place, close to another incident. They all target people in a passive way. The person is not there to see the dogs or kids get hurt but he or she knows it will bring fear to the public. The tree markings are always made so that they are visible to people passing by, and all of the incidents occur late at night or early in the morning. Hidden glass, balls of bread, and the tree attacks stick out for being very uncommon and strange, as well as elaborate. The map looks the same even with these new attacks, with a similar dead zone. Now, my question to you all at RBI. What do you think? Could these be linked somehow? Do you think it's the same person? Can you see something, a pattern, or other? Please share all your thoughts and theories. User Pepper Phoenix would comment this and included a picture of the bus routes in the area. In their comment, they correlate the attacks with the bus routes, so I have overlaid the bus map over the attack map. It's not perfect, but I believe it still works, so I'll use it while reading Pepper Phoenix's comment. With the exception of August to September 2021, each series of attacks has had multiple incidents close to or at the bus stop called Lawrenceburg. Perhaps this is how they are accessing the area? I am basing this mostly off of dog attacks at first, though the rest seem to also follow the pattern. In fact, most of these attacks seem to be centered on 
or near the red route on this map, with only one or two straying very far. The most recent ones are notable for being in the city center and around the Sorgan Free stop on the red route. Could the perp be getting careless and attacking closer to home as they gain confidence from not being caught? The outlier attacks appear to lie along the black route, which intersects with the red at three different spots. They could easily have changed the buses. Some are on the gray route that has Toftagen on it. This intersects both the black and red lines at Varnhem. I would be looking in that area for your perp. Edit. In August, there was a big slap festival right in that park. With so many people around, they likely had to change locations. However, I don't know if the festival went ahead in 2021 due to the pandemic, so that part could be way off. Edit again. Look at the August and September 2021 attacks. They are all on or near the pink route. Could the perp be related to the buses somehow? The southernmost attack from September 25th of 2021 also falls literally on the bus stop on that grade 33 route. I am more and more confident they are using the buses. The westernmost attack is at the terminus of the black route, northernmost, orange route, easternmost, the grade 33, 34, and 35 route again. The weird one on the island is on route 33 again. Based on my theory that the routes intersecting at Vardhem may be significant, I looked for restaurants in that area. The next stop down, Elstorp, has a pizzeria almost next door. The very first attacks fit the black and pink routes the best. I now have a headache from trying to match up the stylized bus route map and the real one, especially in a language I don't speak or read. Plus it's 2am, so I'm heading to bed. Hope this is helpful. One more thing before I crash for the night. OP, keep an eye on who is making comments and etc. about this on local media, Facebook, local neighborhood websites, etc. Depending on their motivation, the culprit may be finding all of the buzz and attention intriguing, funny, or even thrilling. If so, you may find that they interact with a lot of the community about the subject. Take a look and see if anyone seems off in their reactions, especially the more vocal ones since the perp is probably following the whole thing quite closely. And for Christ's sake, be careful, this person is escalating. If they feel sufficiently cornered or decide to escalate more, you or your dog could become a target. Stay safe. I gotta say, after reading this and looking at both maps, I definitely believe that the suspect is hopping on the bus while committing at least some of these attacks. I mean, at almost every attack site, there is a bus station nearby. And then, there's the alarming number of attacks that are directly on the bus routes. In another comment, Pepper Phoenix states that they studied forensic science in university and theorizes that whoever this is, is feeding off of the attention that they're receiving, likely feeling a sense of power for targeting the vulnerable, pets, and children, all while getting away with it. Phoenix does admit that this is all theory and speculation, but I can't help but agree with them. The next update came on April 18th of 2023, about two months after the last one, and it goes like this. It's been a while, and I've received a lot of messages from you guys for an update, so I will try and get you up to date with everything that's going on. First of all, once again, I want to thank all of you who have reached out, commented, and posted your theories. It has helped a lot, and I, and many others, are working on crossing some of them from the list of to-dos. So, since my last update, there has been a lot of media coverage. Svitsvekskan, the local paper in Malmo, has a series of different investigative articles on the dog tormentor. A lot of what they have written about is stuff you already know from my previous two posts about this. Something is new. For instance, an interview with an American FBI agent named Mark Safarik, who put his two cents in on the case. I have investigated many serial animal killings in my career, but it has always been cats that were affected, never dogs. What you have in Malmo is fascinating and disturbing, says Mark. It has been going on for a long time, at least since 2020, and a number of incidents have been reported, but no dog has died yet. This makes me believe that the process is important to this individual, and that it is not certain that he actually wants to kill, he says. He believes that there are more effective ways to harm dogs than to cut sharp metal pieces and bake them into bread, or to prepare meat with nails or metal. If the goal was to kill, he should have realized by now that that method doesn't work. Yet he continues, since he developed the method and came up with these stars, says Mark. For this individual, just like for some serial killers I have worked with, the preparations are important. Collecting materials, collecting metal, baking, it can all be a slow process to make hundreds of these buns, but it is still satisfying for him. He can fantasize during that time. 
Mark does not believe that the cans used for the dangerous metal stars say anything about the perp. At least nothing that can help in the search for him. The dog torturer may have come across these cans by chance. However, it is possible that the person has metal working as a hobby. What do the different methods sometimes meet, sometimes bred tell you? The behavior is so unique that it is most likely the same person. Basically, it's the same activity, even though he uses different materials. It could simply depend on what is available at the time or how much time he has. That the dog torturer holds on to his basic methods over a long period of time speaks to Mark's theory about the motive, to terrorize and instill fear, rather than actually killing dogs. He doesn't go after certain individuals, but after all dogs, it could be very well that he enjoys getting feedback when it is reported in the media, but also that he feels that he can manipulate the police without getting caught. Mark highlights an important experience from the FBI's profiling of serial criminals that gives hope for finding the right person. The perpetrator's need for appreciation, or to be seen, makes them talk easily. Both with mass murderers and serial killers, we have noted such leaks. In their contacts with their surroundings, individuals reveal important information. Often, certain elements of truth are woven together with lies. Leaks how? Inappropriate or offensive comments that people around him find strange, but most dismiss or explain away. In conversations with others about the dog attacks, he may say, for example, the perpetrator seems to be good at what he does, or I can understand that someone would want to, a kind of reverse praise for himself. Here, the media can play a role, Mark says, by appealing to those around the person who have heard strange statements. If you hear someone saying something unpleasant or odd, at least consider informing the police. I know that many people don't want to get involved, but that is the kind of commitment that is needed to move forward. There have been no reported dangerous buns or meat pieces since January of this year, an unusually long period of calm. Considering the statistics of recent years, the dog torturer may have been scared into silence, temporarily. Perpetrators who follow what is written stop or decrease their activity if the media coverage becomes too overwhelming, says Mark. In some cases, they can also change their area of approach. But your dog abuser won't do that. He seems to have acted only in Malmo. I will say he would stay there because he knows the city. You say he, but is it a man or a woman? All the serial offenders I have seen who have targeted animals have been men. We cannot exclude a woman, but statistically, it is probably a man. Mark repeatedly emphasizes how important preparations are for the offender. They completely fulfill the psychological need. For the dog abuser, he can hardly be present or watch dogs eat bread rolls or meat. Overall, this indicates mental illness, according to Mark, and he is sure that the dog abuser will continue, no matter how murky the motivations seem. If he was angry at a particular dog for something that happened, it is more understandable to attack out of anger or revenge, but eventually that feeling disappears as it is acted out. The question is whether the dogs are the target or merely a tool for this serial offender. Has he made some adaptations to his behavior? Given that it has been going on for a long time, it is unlikely that he is trying to find new ways to attack. He will continue. And yes, there was a long pause since the last incident's late January. But now, he, she, slash they are back. Last week, one incident early Monday morning. Same balls of bread with sharp objects inside. Today, one more incident with the same thing. Same modus as all the rest of the incidents. This time, however, the new incident does not follow the usual pattern location-wise. These two are quite far apart and outside of the hot spots. See the highlighted pins on the map. He will most likely be following the media coverage and is probably doing this in an attempt to confuse. And as usual, no one has seen anything. In the incident last week, there were security cameras in the vicinity. I reported this to the police as quick as I could, but since it was a holiday, I think it was too late to retrieve anything. But who knows, hopefully I'll get an update on that soon. Other than that, nothing really new right now unfortunately. I have done some media, and I have opened an anonymous hotline with a phone number you can call 24-7. Also an anonymous form for anyone to fill out who thinks they may have some valuable information about the case. My next step now is to plaster the 250 posters I picked up today all over town that has all the important information about the case and some links and a QR code for reporting stuff. I have also made all the police reports available for free to anyone who wants them. So now, I hope there are hundreds of private detectives running around looking for this person. As of today, I have a little Facebook group and chat 
with two other people who are doing some very cool stuff that I can't go into detail about right now, but I really think we are onto some good stuff. Now, RBI, I want to ask you, if you read this and think, hey, I think I can help here, feel free to contact me here in a comment or send a private message. My dream is to have a team of people with different knowledge and skills that I can join together and work on this case hard. I will be back for update three. Cheers. This is definitely a lot to take in, and it really reminds me of the Don't F With Cats Netflix documentary. Here, we have another sick individual who is attempting to harm animals, all while the locals and the internet are in a frenzy to find out who they are. Hopefully this doesn't end up like the documentary, and this person doesn't eventually take the life of another human being. As far as the third update, I haven't seen anything, and it has been some time since this last one was uploaded. As of right now, we have no names, no description, or any other personal information that could help us find out who this is. I wanted to cover this post because to my knowledge, nobody has been caught yet, and making a video about this could help spread awareness. So if you live in the area or feel that you may be of some assistance, you can go comment on their post and contact LP so that you can help aid in putting a stop to this. But regardless of where you live, just make sure that anywhere you go, you keep a close eye on your pets and always make sure to check your surroundings as best as you can because there are sick people out there and you never know what they're capable of. To start this episode off, I thought we could do a little bit of true crime. This post was uploaded by a now deleted user on February 23rd of 2021 and it references a cold case that happened in 2015. Peggy McGuire, missing from Oklahoma since 2015, on February 22nd of 2021, Peggy's 13-year-old son, Ethan McIntosh, was reportedly missing. Coincidence or something sinister? Peggy was 29 years old when she was last seen in Stenham, Oklahoma on November 16th of 2015. She was last seen that day dropping off her son at school. She was supposed to attend her niece's ball game that evening, but never arrived. At 5 a.m. the day after Peggy was last seen, a surveillance camera caught footage of an adult male getting out of her then-missing truck at TNJ's Ice House 10 miles away from her home in Eufaula, Oklahoma. Family reports that Peggy did not drink or frequent that bar. The man could not be identified. When the truck was found, Peggy's husband Thomas went to the scene and was interviewed. He stated that he believed Peggy had merely run away, though his son later told investigators that McIntosh told him his mother had ran away and her truck was left at TNJ's before it had officially been found. Peggy's family and friends have told the media that she and Thomas had a violent relationship and that Peggy had taken out a protective order against him in the past, as well as had charges pressed for battery. She only reconciled to preserve her son's home. At the time of her disappearance, her relationship with Thomas was described as platonic and she had begun seeing other people. Swabs of blood-like stains on her couch and in the bucket of a front-loading tractor have also been taken. Peggy is a mother and was recently registered as a nurse when she vanished. A $150,000 reward has been offered for information in her disappearance. Peggy remains missing. If you have any information regarding the disappearance or whereabouts of Peggy McGuire, you are encouraged to contact the McIntosh County Sheriff's Office at 918-689-2526. Date of birth, unknown, circa 1986. Description, Peggy was 5'10 and 140 to 160 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. She has a tattoo on her lower back of a horseshoe with stars and the four-leaf clover with the faded initials, JNS. She also has a scar on her knee and her ears are pierced. She wears size 10 shoes. Sources disagree about Peggy's ethnicity. Some list her as biracial, white Native American, while others list her as white. This write-up is a copy of the first article linked below. I hope that's okay. The OP also included these links to articles with more information about what happened to Peggy. I will go over one of them, but they will all be included in the description for you to check out for yourselves. Monday marks two weeks since Peggy McGuire was last seen dropping off her young son at school outside Eufaula, Oklahoma. A grainy image captured the next morning at around 5 a.m. shows Peggy's Toyota truck being parked at TNJ's Ice House, a rural bar along Highway 9. A dark unidentified figure can be seen walking away from the vehicle through an early morning storm. That's where the trail appears to go cold, leaving family, friends, and thousands of complete strangers painfully anxious. She wouldn't just up and leave her little boy. Something is wrong. Betty Davis, Peggy's mother, told Dateline, I just want my Peggy back. What if I never see her again? Peggy is a licensed practical nurse who just passed her boards this June. According to her mother, she loves animals. And in addition to her pet dogs, she helps care for more than 150 head of cattle and a small group of goats. 
She spends her time working hard, volunteering as a youth basketball coach, and taking care of her son. There is now a $17,500 reward offered by several local businesses, including her employer, for information aiding in her safe return. The last person to reportedly speak with Peggy was her stepfather, whom she phoned that morning on the way to the home she shares with her son and her boy's father. She was going to call him back shortly with the measurements for a new deck, her mother said. She never called, nor did she show up at her niece's ball game that evening. Another day passed with no contact. Her mother filed the missing persons report on Wednesday of that week, leaving about 48 hours between the time Peggy vanished and when police became involved. I couldn't get her on Monday or Tuesday, and neither could anyone else, said Betty. She was completely off the grid. Now it's two weeks later and nothing, just nothing. McIntosh County Sheriff Kevin Ledbetter said Peggy's truck has been processed by the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation and several items have been sent along for further testing. Initial indications, however, do not point to what may have happened to Peggy. A warrant was issued for the cell phone records on the 19th, but results could take weeks to be fully processed. Warrants have also been filed for her financial records and social media information. We have to investigate it as if it is the most serious case you could think of. Whatever may have happened, we have to treat it that way. Whether some harm has come to her or she is healthy and safe, somewhere on her own free will, Sheriff Ledbetter told Dateline. Some in the community have questioned why more searches haven't been conducted. To answer, according to Sheriff Ledbetter, is there simply isn't a starting point at this time for a ground search of the 300 and plus square mile area. We've been working on it from day one, said Sheriff Ledbetter. The problem is, we don't have a point to really go off of. Once we do, we will launch whatever resources are necessary to investigate it further. We are following up with any and all leads we get. The Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation also continues to assist in the case. Outside of the official investigation underway, volunteers have filed in to score the thickets in rural landscape for the slightest clue. Family members have flown in from North Carolina and California. Online message boards and social media channels remain abuzz with those who are curious and concerned about Peggy. The Facebook group, Bring Peggy Home, has garnered more than 4,600 members. I'm not leaving until we have answers, Betty told Dateline. I don't live more than a drive away, but that's not close enough. It's raining and cold out, and all I can do is pray my Peggy is somewhere dry and warm. A bit further into the post, the OP managed to provide an update on Peggy's son, Ethan. Peggy McGuire's 13-year-old son, Ethan McIntosh, was reportedly missing yesterday on February 22nd of 2021. Ethan's father, Thomas McIntosh, the prime suspect in Peggy's disappearance, refused Peggy's mother, Betty Davis, visitation with her grandson, Ethan, after the disappearance of Peggy in 2015, prompting Betty to take court action, resulting in Ethan being removed from Thomas's care and placed into foster care in 2016. I don't have any more details as to why he was put in foster care, or if Betty did in fact get custody, as I've been trying to gather more details on Ethan's disappearance. So far everything is mum. Despite a massive search party along with helicopters, no details are being released except for this news article I linked below. I am an Oklahoma resident. I live a few hours away from where he was last seen, but there's also been no Amber Alerts posted at this time. Something is way off about this. Ethan was last seen operating an orange Kubota tractor, I'm guessing helping with chores. The tractor was abandoned on the land where he was working, but no signs of Ethan. Jumping into the comments, a user by the name of Wilted Petals would say this. So, obviously the dad is the common thread. Why has there been no searches done on his property or anything? To which the OP would reply with, I have no idea. That's why I decided to write this up. It seems as if this child could be in imminent danger considering the documented claims of abuse and his father being the murder suspect in his missing mother's case. I don't know why it's not getting more attention. It makes me sad. I just have a bad feeling. I don't know what can be done. Maybe more people are talking about it or spreading one of the links I shared. If you're in Oklahoma, keep your eyes out. There's pictures of Ethan in the links under his update. I do think that there will be an Amber Alert issued sometime today, but I hope it's not too late. His case at the moment is being handled by the tribe, Creek Nation, the Light Horseman. Since he was last seen on Indian land, so this automatically turns into a federal investigation. Since the state of Oklahoma has no jurisdiction, Stidham, Oklahoma is a small town. I'm sure they are trying to gather all the facts and figure out who has precedent over this. It's unbelievable that he just goes missing, leaving that expensive tractor unsupervised. If you're from rural America, you'll understand how much people value their equipment. I do feel since the ruling of McGirt versus Oklahoma, which flipped Oklahoma on its butt when it comes to Indian law and state law, matters like this where it's urgent can be easily lost in translation and neglected. Some of the links that the OP had originally provided were not working anymore and were also not archived on the Wayback Machine. But fortunately, in the final update of this original post, we managed to get some good news about Ethan. Ethan was found alive. He was found about an hour ago. No further details available at the moment, but I did link the story. 
I'm so relieved. I've been sick over this all morning. Thanks to everyone who commented and shared, Ethan's mother going missing in 2015 really shook up our little rural communities in Oklahoma. If anything, the one positive to come from this is that Peggy McGuire's case got a lot of attention and was back in discussions all over social media platforms. Peggy and her family are still waiting for justice, and I can only cross my fingers and hope that one day they'll receive it. Hug your loved ones a little longer tonight. At the time this post was made, it had already been around five years since Peggy disappeared. And on top of that, it has been three years since Ethan went missing and was later found. In total, Peggy's whereabouts have remained unknown for about eight years at the time of this recording. And while researching the case, I actually found this article on the CrimeWire website, written by Jane Hassenplug, on September 14th of 2023. Coincidentally, the same week that I originally began looking into this. Jade goes over the case in amazing detail and lays everything out very well. I highly encourage you to check it out for yourself. In the article, we get to learn a lot more about Peggy and her and Thomas's relationship as well. I won't read the whole thing, but I will read some sections. In high school, she met a boy named Thomas McIntosh, who was the complete opposite of Peggy. He was awkward, rude, antisocial, and known as a bully, but Peggy fell in love with him anyways. It soon became apparent that he had jealousy issues, as he would become enraged when Peggy would be seen talking with other male friends. Peggy once had to have her best friend Elizabeth take her to the ER for a broken and bloody nose. It took a bit of convincing, but Peggy eventually confided the truth to her best friend. After a lunch date with Thomas, he got angry about something, pulled out his pistol, and hit her in the face with it. It was clear that Peggy was attempting to provide what she believed was the best for her child Ethan, trying very hard to make it work with Thomas. But eventually it seems like the abuse reached this boiling point, and Peggy began attempting to distance herself from Thomas. But like many toxic relationships, Thomas was able to convince her to stay. Despite the toxic environment, Peggy was able to graduate from nursing school in June of 2013. And after some time, Peggy began secretly seeing other people and planning how she was going to get away from Thomas. Sadly, on November 16th of 2015, Peggy disappeared and has not been found since. My gut reaction was if he was helping on the tractor at his dad's property, maybe he came across something. Maybe his mom's body? If that was the case, he could have either ran away or confronted his dad. This is scary, and alarming how much hasn't been done. I was coming here to post this. Definitely an interesting case, and not being investigated the way that it should. There is also a lot of question of who actually had custody of the boy. It was originally a custody battle between the dad and the maternal grandmother. It ended up with him being sent to foster care. There are rumors that the father's family have ties to the police in the town. I haven't checked these out. This is just talks from the locals. Such a heartbreaking case. The number one theory I found was that Thomas found out about Peggy talking to and seeing other men, then took her life in a fit of jealous rage. But to this day, he has not been formally charged with the disappearance to my knowledge. I always like to cover cases like this because I believe they deserve more attention. I personally believe that Thomas may know more than he says, but that is just my opinion, and he is to be presumed innocent until found guilty. All we can do now is wait for Peggy to hopefully come home or that somebody comes out with more information. In the spooky season spirit, I decided to look into the r slash paranormal subreddit. And while many of these stories in this sub are just that, stories, I did find this one that I found pretty interesting. The post was uploaded by the Reddit user Robert812003 on September 23rd of 2023. Someone spoke to me from my empty basement last night. What should I do? Last night I couldn't sleep at all, which is fairly normal since I work graveyard shifts and it's pretty much turned me into a night owl. So even on my days off, I'm usually up all night long. So I'm up in bed watching a rom-com, laughing and in a great mood and decided that I deserve to treat myself to the occasional drink. My bar is in my basement, which is fully finished and furnished. It's pretty much a man cave. I've spent entire nights there by myself or with the gang and nothing strange has ever happened. So anything creepy or weird down there was absolutely the furthest thing from my mind. I finish laughing my butt off and head down there. I go behind a bar, pour myself a drink, and head upstairs. But as soon as I'm on the second to last step to the first floor, from behind me I hear, Hey! Coming from downstairs in the middle of the basement. It was an older man's voice, in their 50s I think. I know the house is empty except for me, and it scared the absolute shit out of me. I looked down there and nothing moved. No one spoke or came forward, and I freaked the fuck out. I jetted up the last two steps and slammed the basement door closed. I'm wondering, 
Did I imagine that? Is there someone in my house? And as I stand there panicking, I hear the same man's voice coming from down in the basement but muffled by the door. By the intonation, he asked a question, then continued to talk right after. He was talking to me. The question sounded something like, where are you going? I couldn't make out much, especially what he said after that, but I was panicked, adrenaline pumping, and said fuck this shit. Someone broke into my house. I ran into the next room, grabbed my flashlight, my handy dandy baseball bat, and headed the hell back down there. And then, silence. Just silence. Slowly I turned on every light in every room down there, ready to bash some homeless man's head in. I'm sorry to all the homeless people, but nothing. Every nook and corner checked, and the basement is completely empty, except for my panicking and heavily breathing ass. I noped the fuck out of there, locked myself in my bedroom, and spent the next hour in crisis mode checking my basement cameras, which showed nothing, and no one except for me pouring myself a drink, and then coming back down there, running around like a madman with a bat a minute later. I went down to the basement this afternoon after I woke up, with my trusty bat in hand, and rechecked the whole place. I found nothing. No one. Just me questioning both my sanity and reality. I know what I heard. That guy was pretty loud, and he was talking in my direction, and at me. Even through the door I heard him talking down there at me up the stairs. It seemed like he was trying to have a conversation with me. I have never had any kind of break in, or any kind of remotely strange experience down there in my 15 years here. Does stuff like this happen to people out of the blue? Or am I finally losing my ever-loving mind? I don't know what to do now. Redditors were quick to offer their advice, starting with the user Spooky Rug. Something very similar happened to me as a teenager in my childhood home. My family was away on vacation, and I had decided to stay home to look after our pets. It was nighttime, and my dogs were outside, so I was alone in the house. While walking towards the kitchen, I heard a man's voice call my name very loudly from our small office. The lights were off in the office, so I was just peering into a dark doorway. It scared the absolute shit out of me. I had the same reaction as you. I grabbed my baseball bat from the garage and searched the whole house. I never found anything. All the doors were locked, and my dogs didn't seem concerned when they came back inside. I never heard that voice again. Hopefully it was just a weird one-off occurrence. The adrenaline is real. That shit was scary as fuck. I was legit going to call the cops after a few minutes, but stopped myself when I realized that all I can really say is that I heard someone down there, but checked and found absolutely no one or even a single thing out of place. A voice whispering or calling my name? Me and my siblings experienced that in this house multiple times, but that was like 15 to 20 years ago. Been shouted out of my sleep once too by a voice a foot away from me, which terrified me so much that I flipped out of bed and crumbled onto the floor. Called me by some archaic sounding name that I never remotely heard, and it screamed at me like the bastard was very angry and disappointed in me. Past life family crap? A teacher? But as much as I feel that it wasn't, that may have been something hypnagogic. Did you check the ceiling? I live on my own with a cat. Sometimes I swear I hear my mom knocking on the door to wake me up. And it does wake me up. And it scares the shit out of me when I remember she's not staying here. When she is down, I sometimes forget and it scares the shit out of me when I hear the front door going because her boyfriend is going out for a smoke. I have no idea who slash what knocks on my door. The cat sometimes bangs and scratches at the door. I guess if I'm asleep too long or too late, she gets worried or just wants in. But she's not allowed in my room when I'm asleep because she's creepy, rattles things, knocks things over, scares me, and I don't like her going under my bed. I always found my grandparents' house creepy when I was growing up there. We lost my granddad nine months ago, and grandma's still living there. She's recently admitted that she finds it creepy too, having never believed me in the past when I said about the ominous feeling I got there at night. Um, yeah. The ceiling of the basement is basically only a one and a half foot tall extension off the actual two and a half to three foot crawl space, which goes well off under the opposite side of the house. Anything more than five pounds of weight would have them crashing through the ceiling panels and to the floor. They're faux panels. They're like paper mache, made to look like wood but basically composed of cardboard. The fact that I have to justify this is semi-insane, but there isn't anyone crawling between my floorboards. Somehow I doubt that the voice and talking I heard are due to a cat that I don't have. I have no animals and no one else here. No raccoons, snakes, or any other weird animals that could converse with humans or even start a conversation in English. Eventually, the OP would provide us with an update on the original post. It happened at 1.50 a.m. At this point, I believe it mostly was paranormal, and I think I'm going down there tonight to repeat the same exact process at the same time to see what happens. My curiosity has gotten the better of me, and I want to know what he slash it has to say. If it's actually an intruder, I'm coming prepared this time, but it should still be very interesting. 
user night owl 1984 but ask the OP this. Do you think it's possible someone was trying to play a prank on you? Not even remotely possible to be honest. Either some guy was hiding in the crawl space of my basement, hopped onto my dryer, and back in there and screwed the metal covers from behind him in less than 20 seconds without making any noise, or something was speaking to me. Fuck that. I'm checking the crawl space now. Thank you for the reminder. Check just now. Nothing but dirt, dust, spiders, leaves, and maybe the remains of a dead squirrel. No dirt or dust disturbed in what looks like a decade in there. Going through the comments, it appears as if the OP has basically tried and checked every possibility for what the talking was, ruling out someone coming in through the windows, a possible Bluetooth speaker, and even sleep deprivation. They did, however, give us a second update on the post. Update 2. I've been down here from 1.45am until 3am, walking around, asking, looking, and nothing. Part of me feels like it needs the darkness or even just the element of unpredictability in order to manifest. Maybe it needs a buildup of energy which it discharged last night, so it's tapped out right now. No idea. I have nothing to show for it tonight. But don't say I didn't try. Feel free to ask any further questions. I'll keep an eye on the basement and if anything happens, you'll all absolutely hear from me. I have to say that the OP is very brave. It would be very interesting to see if the OP was able to conduct a paranormal investigation with cameras, recording devices, and any other kind of paranormal gear. The final thing I was able to find was a reply to Night Owl, who was asking about the possibility of a Bluetooth device being the culprit. I'm as antisocial as you can get, I guess. People just don't seem to like me, and I don't really like their fake facades and BS, so I haven't really had anyone over here in at least six years now. I mean, I have a friend who will come by once every year or two, drink a bunch of booze, and then be on his merry way, but somehow he never gets a response to any of my texts. Must be spotty service like he says. Anyways, yeah my cameras are on Wi-Fi, and I have a Bluetooth speaker near the TV, but what I heard was not a speaker, nor did it come from anywhere near any camera or the speaker. Center of the room, right where I was looking. Direct speech seemingly originating from mid-air. Not some groan or whisper from across the room, but a pretty loud man talking at me right where there was nothing. If the voice had reverberated or been off at all, I'd have known. No, this was spoken from 12 feet down in the middle of the room by a person and directly to me. And for now, that's all we have. Do you believe in ghosts? Okay, get ready for the last one. Uploaded on April 5th of 2021, a Reddit user by the name That Might Not Be a Murderer came onto the RBI sub with an extensive four-part write-up in an attempt to clear their father's name. My dad might not be responsible for a murder suicide from 2015. Cross post because I was directed here by r slash true crime discussion. Bear with me, as I recount this to my best ability, I have to remain somewhat vague in some details in order to protect my anonymity. However, I will do my best to be as clear as possible about the series of events. Okay. In September of 2015, my dad's girlfriend Sherry started an affair with one of his friends, Billy. Billy and my dad had been friends since high school, and I knew him well. He was nerdy and kind of weird, but he was nice enough. My dad, not surprisingly, was pretty upset about the affair, but he and Sherry were already having relationship issues, and I think he was happy to find a reason to leave her officially. I know he had a few relatively cordial run-ins with Sherry and Billy, as they all lived in the same town, but he had mostly cut them both off entirely. During this time, Sherry moved to a new house only a few streets from my dad. By Thanksgiving of 2015, my dad was roughing it a little. I think he was still kind of bummed out about the affair, but he had recently been in a car accident resulting in him losing his job due to a back injury, so additionally, he was having some money issues pending a lawsuit settlement he was waiting on. By December, he was back on the mend and in pretty good spirits. We were very close and spent a lot of time together hanging out or going to bars and concerts. At the beginning of December at 8am, my dad called me at work. We only spoke for about 10 minutes, but he was in a great mood. We had some laughs and made plans to hang out for the weekend. He mentioned very briefly that Sherry had called him about an hour earlier, but he ignored the call. I barely even remember him saying it. I got home from work that night and my phone rang. It was my family friend calling me to tell me that my dad was dead, but she didn't have any other details. I was totally shocked. I had no idea what was going on and I was in instant denial because we just made plans. I had a million things running through my head, car accident, heart attack, etc. A few moments later, my dad's two brothers and my grandmother knock on my door. It was true and my dad was dead. However, the biggest shock was that Sherry was also dead. A murder suicide. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. To add insult to injury, 
Billy was the one who found their bodies at Sherry's house and was currently being interviewed by police. I took a call from one of the investigators on the scene. He mentioned that it was a cut and dry case, two adults deceased, each with a gunshot wound to the head. My dad was still clutching the gun. My dad was a hunter, so I was curious about the murder weapon. To my surprise, it was a small gauge handgun, but it wasn't my dad's, it was Sherry's. Odd, but okay. During this call, and I will never understand why he found these details necessary, but he told me that my dad and Sherry had consensual sex prior to their deaths. He also told me that there was a gap between the deaths, that likely my dad killed Sherry, had instant regret, paced and considered his options, and ultimately decided to unalive himself. As I'm listening to this, I just cannot wrap my mind around any of it, because it was just so out of character for my dad. And Nana, I don't believe my dad could do something like this kind of way, like a real sincere confusion. First off, he wasn't even that depressed about the affair. They had already been split up for three months at this point, and he was seemingly pretty happy in the wake of it all. Secondly, as I mentioned before, Sherry was living in a new house. My dad didn't know this house at all, so why would he have ended up with her gun in her house? He had his own guns. Thirdly, I knew that she had called him that morning, and he ignored her call. It doesn't feel like someone desperate to kill another person would pass up an opportunity for an interaction with that person. None of it made sense, but I had to come to terms with the information I was given and trust the police department knew what they were doing. Not to mention, I had a funeral to plan and some deep grieving to do. A few days later, I made the trip over to my dad's house to collect his belongings and settle his affairs. His house was shockingly fully on, like lights on, TV on, cat not fed, morning coffee and weed still on the coffee table, back door unlocked, etc. It was like he raced out of the door really quick with full intentions of being right back. This was not the home of someone who left with the intention of never returning. I know mental illness can and will do strange things to people, but if nothing else, he would have never let this cat go hungry. Yet another red flag in my mind, but I continued forth. Eventually, I was given some of his belongings from the scene of the crime by the police, and my boyfriend decided to go through his phone to see if there were any signs of what might have occurred. We found that after I spoke with him, he did end up answering a call from Sherry which was around 11 seconds long, but we also found a slew of really weird text messages. None of the texts appeared to have been from my dad, because one, he had terrible grammar, and two, he didn't even know how to text. I have never received a text from my dad in my entire life. He had a flip phone with a T9 in 2015. So many people reached out to me saying this doesn't feel right, and I agreed. I didn't feel like any of it felt right, but I had nothing of any real substance other than gut instinct to guide me, which is not enough when dealing with the police or investigators. At one point, I literally had to ask people to just stop telling me that they thought this was somehow a setup because I couldn't do anything about it and I was starting to lose sleep over it. I was scared to death of turning into one of those people who obsess over something out of sheer denial. No one is going to take my plight seriously and I already knew that I would be overlooked and disregarded. So for the last five years, I have done nothing but stress and silence. Until now. This past Friday, I took a call from someone very close to my dad's friend group urging me to push harder into reopening my dad's case. Recently, it has come to light that Billy is apparently a master con artist and a fraud. I guess Sherry is one of three girlfriends that Billy has found dead since 2010. This is where I need your help, Reddit. Here's the information I was given. At some point prior to my dad and Sherry's death, Billy was dating a woman who had recently come into money. Shortly after, this woman was found dead at the bottom of her stairs. Around the time Billy started his affair with Sherry, she had recently inherited between 500 and 800 K from her father passing away. Billy's current girlfriend has had organ failure since last year. She recently inherited a large sum of money and Billy found her dead last Tuesday. Now I know she was already sick, but the rumor is that she pleaded for medical help for days. And I guess he just basically let her suffer. I also found out that Billy took photos of my dad and Sherry's body before he bothered to call the police. He later showed those photos to his young daughter. He has also told the story of how he found their bodies numerous times to the same person. Yet the story has been told in three different ways. Did he take the photos as some sick trophy? Or did he take the photos to be able to maintain his narrative? Upon learning this information, I kept thinking, but why would he have to kill my dad in order to steal Sherry's money? And then it finally dawned on me today that it was so my dad could be the scapegoat. He had to use my dad to portray a crime of passion scene so he could pretend to be a victim in the whole thing. Even though he was interviewed by police, it was just an interview, not an interrogation. The investigators said it was a cut and dry scene. They would have had no motive to interrogate him because as far as they could tell, the murderer was already dead. However, I do know there was about an hour in his timeline that day that was unaccounted for. Billy has a very high IQ. I don't think he would have ever been strong enough to fight my dad in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but I very much believe he could easily have outsmarted him. 
My current conspiracy theory is that Billy went to Sherry's house that morning before work, had consensual sex with her, killed her, then used her phone to call my dad, which was the 7 a.m. call. My dad didn't answer the call, and Billy went to work to maintain his story. I think Billy then used his lunch break, the unaccounted for hour, and also the almost identical time to my dad's death, to go back to Sherry's house where he used her phone to call my dad again. This is the 11 second call that my dad did answer, that caused him to race over to Sherry's house leaving his house in the state I found it in two days later. I think he tricked my dad into coming to Sherry's where he would have been caught off guard and out of his element for an attack. I also think this could be where the gap in their deaths could be. I think Billy went back to work for the rest of the day and then found my dad and Sherry, where he took the photos and then called the police. Here's my problem. I have no idea what to do. I don't know how to reopen a closed case. I don't have any direction on who to speak with. I have tried the police department who handled my dad's case, the local FBI, and the state attorney general, and no one can tell me who can help me with this. Do I need a private investigator? Do I need an attorney? Is this worth looking into at all? I would love to clear my dad's name and take this terrible weight off my family's shoulders once and for all. I am also fully prepared to accept that I could be wrong, but now I have to know. Any help is greatly appreciated. Edit. Some people have asked how Billy would have been able to financially gain from any of these women considering he wasn't married to any of them. I don't know any intimate details of the woman who was found at the bottom of the stairs, other than she had recently come into money and that he was the one who found her. I don't know her name or how he would have benefited from her monetarily dead or alive. However, even though there is no current confirmation of whether he did or he didn't gain from her, she is still one of three women he has found dead. In regards to Sherry, she was never married and never had children, so there is no one to account for her finances other than her. She was also a little flighty, and I can see him being able to easily manipulate her or just flat out steal from her openly without her noticing right away. In regards to the most recent dead girlfriend, there is actual proof that he stole at least 10,000 from her leading up to her death. A user by the name Opening Thought 5736 would comment this. Your best bet here may be piggybacking on the current situation with the newly dead woman where 10,000 is missing. If I was a grieving or angry relative of the woman who died with organ failure, who pleaded for help with 10,000 missing, and you somehow made contact with me saying, I'm sorry to bother you, but there's something fishy about this man and I want to tell you more. You better bet your ass on your bottom dollar I would track you down immediately to find out everything you can tell me. Ditto likewise if I'm an investigator and there is any kind of actual investigation whatsoever going on into Billy now, finally in this new situation. I'm an investigator and you contact me saying you know something about this man and his history with women that you think may be relevant to a case and you want to be helpful? Focus on helpful. Fuck yes, I'm calling you. Piggyback onto the current case. Use it to get law enforcement and investigators to listen to the information about your situation and for it to be reactivated, or at least significantly looked into based on that. Law enforcement and investigators, listen to other law enforcement and investigators. If someone from jurisdiction XYZ, where the poor organ failure lady died calls up to the law enforcement in your area and says, hey, I need to ask you some questions. Let's look into this. They'll listen. I'm not saying that will be an open sesame to magically get all your painful questions finally answered and resolved. Only that it might be your best bet at this point in shoehorning your way back into your dad's closed case the opportunity just fell right in your lap, and someone notified you of it because this is what they want you to do. Do it. You are exactly right. They are exactly right. You can probably foyer any other document relating to his past relationships also. Getting the relevant evidence, circumstances, time frames, causes of death, etc. will only help building the information case against the evidence they have about your dad, wishing you utterly the best in this tragic nonsense. I believe the OP took the advice of these users because in a second edit to the post, the OP would say this. After the recommendations of everyone, which by the way, thank you all, I have taken a few additional measures since yesterday. I have filed for a foyer regarding all documents that I am able to obtain, and I have also reached out via email personally to the chief and deputy chief of the police department who handled the case. And just a few days later, the OP would come back with an update on the foyer situation. I'm going to make this brief as there's not really much to update. First off, I received a ton of wonderful advice and help, which was so greatly appreciated, and I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who became so involved in this. I know there are a lot of people on this sub rooting for me, so I felt that I owe it to everyone to update the current state of the conspiracy. I filed for the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, which is basically the general public's ability to gain access to certain information regarding open, closed, or cold cases. It took a while to get anything back on the inquiry, which didn't matter anyhow, because I fell painfully short. I requested interviews, police reports, DNA information, gunshot residue test results, and rape kit results. Of course, 
I did not request the crime scene photos, as I know eventually I may have to get there, but I thought by requesting what I did, I might be able to gain traction early on without having to look at the pictures of my dead dad. In true fashion, the email I received back basically just said, sorry, no information available. It was a little vague, so I'm unsure if it meant, sorry we don't have these documents period, or sorry these documents are unavailable for release. Which either way, didn't make me feel better, because that means there is very little on the case overall, or that the foyer is pretty much a bullshit way of making people think they have access to this kind of stuff, when they really don't. So dead end there. The second course of action I took was that I personally emailed the deputy police chief from the town that he lived in and just kind of introduced myself, gave him the details of my dad's case, and said, I believe there is more information to be uncovered in this situation, and I think it would be worth your time to look into. Shockingly, he actually responded the very same day and said he was interested in speaking with me. Now, this was over a month ago, and I have not taken the time to do this yet. There are a few reasons behind this. I did not expect to hear from him at all, let alone so fast, so I was a little unprepared. And that's my fault. I believe he is looking to speak over the phone, and I would much rather do a face-to-face sit-down. I am very articulate either way, but I want to see his face and know his reactions. I want to see him writing things down and noting important points I bring up. I would feel like I was more hurt if he could see for himself that I'm not some crazy lady calling into the police department with this wild tale. I just want to know that I'm being taken seriously. I have additional information that I'm trying to add to my portfolio before I sit down with the police. I have a printout of the screenshot from Billy's ex-wife's Facebook page where she is just smearing the hell out of him, bringing to the table pretty much the exact same questions I have, and I ran a background check on him that showcases 19 court appearances regarding collections cases, all of which abruptly stopped about a month after my dad and Sherry died. I need more because what I have just isn't enough yet. I'm considering reaching out to Billy's ex-wife to see if she might be interested in sitting down with me. Now that I know her stance on all of this, she could be a valuable asset to me. However, I am very aware that I could compromise my safety if she declines my invitation and rats me out. I'm torn on this. Additionally, I have my dad's cell phone, and somewhere deep in the desktop archives is a very shitty recording of the guy who Billy told three different stories about how he found my dad and Sherry's bodies retelling their conversation. Furthermore, I am nervous that the police will take me seriously, and once things start unfolding, it's going to turn into a shitstorm. I need to know that my mental health and personal affairs are prepared for finding out that I'm totally wrong about all this, or totally right about all this. Both are terrifying. I have been extremely busy at work, So I put a lot of this on hold intentionally because of that. I just can't handle the anarchy of the situation, plus losing my literal shit every single day at work. Once that starts to slow down, I will dive deeper back into all this and continue to update you all. I am so happy to accept any advice moving forward from where I currently stand, or any recommendations on things I should add to my portfolio that I haven't considered yet. Again, thank you all so much for going down this rabbit hole with me. I am anxious to see it through, to whatever the end might be. The comments under this post went like this, starting with user Lucky Texan. Personally, I think it's a bad idea to wait so long after you yourself had pushed the deputy sheriff, and I thought he was awesome to want to get with you and see what you have. I personally think it'll come to nothing, but this is a great chance for you and you're blowing it. You needed to follow up on this great chance to get something done and or hear what is up. And if you can get him interested, he can make things happen and appoint someone to look into it. Once that happens, you can get moving on this. Good luck and take care. I second this. I totally get where the OP is coming from because I am one of those people who tend to avoid dealing with very important things that have to be taken care of, that I know I have to take care of, and if I don't, it's going to hurt me in a way in the end. Apparently avoidance is common in people with anxiety. I'm still working on this, but if I was in OP's shoes, I can see myself handling it the same way. So yes, we know that it is really important for you to reach out, especially now that they're willing to talk to you because you want them to take it seriously and not as a false tip or whatever they call it. But I know it can be very stressful and cause a lot of anxiety, but you can do it. Like someone suggested, see if you can have a close friend slash relative to rely on when slash if things get very difficult or a good support system, we're rooting for you. For almost a whole year, we didn't get any updates from the OP until March 31st of 2022. Wow, hello everyone. So I know this has been a whirlwind of ups and downs for everyone who has been invested in my story. As always, thank you so much to those who have supported me, offered advice, offered assistance, etc. I'm astounded at the positive feedback I have received since I started this last year. Also, apologies for the gaps in updates and sometimes the lack of information I have when I actually manage to update. I do my best to stay on top of translating what I know over here, but as you can assume, I am just one 33-year-old woman doing this, mostly on my own. So not only can it become daunting to constantly revisit, but also, 
So much changes throughout the process that I can't possibly keep every single aspect straight. This is not a situation changing update or anything. I mainly just wanted to let everyone know that I'm still here. I'm still grinding and I'm still doing everything in my power to get to the bottom of this. A few things. I'm working with an investigative journalist. She reached out back in December to assist me with some additional information that we could look into. And unfortunately, between my old job, starting a new job, the holidays and some other personal issues, I was not able to get back with her until the beginning of this month. Thankfully though, she has not lost sight of our goal and I would be completely lost without her guidance and connections. We have recently started making more headway towards a few unanswered questions, but as these things do, it takes time. She has involved a FOIA expert that is helping to get us going in the right direction. She also involved a retired PI who has taken special interest in my case for fun, so that is really nice. The main issue on the table is still gathering that FOIA information. I was apparently looking in all the wrong places, but she was able to track down a direct contact and a request form that I filled out and submitted yesterday. The contact is an attorney and does not work for the police department, but I already know from previous research that while this information is legally mine to have, it also creates a problem within the police department. This is because typically, when information to closed cases is being reopened and looked into, that means the department will be under a certain level of critique and scrutiny if there is any shortcuts made in the investigations. And as we are clearly aware, the entire case was opened and closed within 24 hours. So I'm certain someone somewhere along the lines is going to try and intervene in my search to get this. I request that any police reports, interview information, toxicology reports, and hit analysis results. The last request I submitted was immediately met with, there is no information regarding this case, which was startling. However, that could have been because I used the wrong avenue to try to get it, and not necessarily because there just isn't any information. Additionally, I am on the fence about the following. I do not know if all of what I requested is just not available to me, but it may not be available at all, simply because little to none of it was actually gathered in the appropriate way. Keep in mind the town this happened in was very small. The police on the scene allowed the person who found the bodies to leave the scene. When that person did return, he was only interviewed and not interrogated. And that person's story is, I found my girlfriend murdered by the dead dude on the couch. So there was very little digging down outside this by the department because they believed that it was an open and shut case. If they do not have the information because they failed to gather it, that will help me prove just how incredibly inept the investigation actually was. Proving that a police department didn't do their job well is not going to prove my dad's innocence or help me prove his innocence. Yes, the department might be looked at poorly and I might be able to get a civil case out of it at the very least, but it will completely set me back at the beginning of my search. If this happens, I will really be doing the legwork on my own at that point because I will be essentially trying to create my own case and gathering my own information. And lastly, Billy has completely disappeared. He has not paid child support to his youngest daughter since 2020 and no one has seen or heard from him at all. This includes him being absent at his eldest daughter's wedding last year. I can't decide if this is going to help or hurt me. In a way, I feel like it just further proves his guilt and shame, but I also feel like he is gone for good. I'm up shit's creek. If I have no bad guy to point a finger at, and no police department records to use against him, I have nothing at all. I will update as soon as I receive additional information. Right now, I can go nowhere without the details from the police report. So until I get that, or know exactly what they are willing to give me, I'm kind of at a stalemate. Personally, I think that Billy's disappearance could have something to do with the OP's investigation. Seeing as how the OP has been contacting people who knew Billy and her father, it is possible that Billy caught wind of this and decided to flee before any investigation could be reopened up. But this, of course, is just speculation on my end. The OP would add two edits to the post later on regarding the FOIA request for the case. Edit. Almost as soon as I posted this update, I received an email from the attorney regarding the foyer. He wants to schedule a call with me this afternoon. I have reached out to the private investigator to see what I should be prepared to discuss. I did find out upon researching him that he is the attorney from the town that this happened in, so I'm not sure how this will help or hurt me. I'm concerned that his best interest will be protecting the police department that he looks over, but I am hopeful that maybe he will be more interested in getting the right answers and not further protecting those who have complicated this for me. I will be going straight to my mom's before the call because I would like to record it in case he gives me bullshit. I will report back. Edit 2. Hey y'all. So the call went pretty well. He is young and seems very intrigued by this entire tell. He made mention that this was nowhere at all on his radar and wanted to know as much as I could jam in our 20 minute call. Unfortunately, he has asked me to meet with the deputy chief next week. Conveniently, this is the same man who was the lead detective on my dad's case six and a half years ago. And the second or third time he has been brought into my line of fire and did absolutely nothing to assist me. I did not make the attorney aware of this, and for the sake of the conversation, I agreed to meet with him. I also recorded the conversation to add to my portfolio. I did want to share the follow-up email that I sent to him this morning, 
to help me better explain a few of my points. This is the email that the OP sent to the attorney. I wanted to take a moment to thank you for your time yesterday and to further clarify some important topics that were either not brought up or were overshadowed during our conversation. Normally, I am a very composed and articulate person, but hopefully you can understand that given these circumstances, the repeated instances that are regularly revealing themselves, and my personal attachment to the case, it starts to go off the rails once I get a little momentum. I understand that this is a complex situation, and I wanted to make a few things more clear than I was able to yesterday. First off, I am not out to conquer a police department, I am not trying to point fingers at weak investigative work, and I am not after money or popularity. I am here to seek nothing other than truth and legitimacy. The label placed on my father has been the scarlet letter of my family for the last six and a half years, and if this just is what it is, I am not afraid of that. The anguish and emotional toll that has plagued me since that day has already done its job of breaking and remaking me. It is pertinent that you understand who I am at my core level, which is someone who has endured both the worst trauma you could possibly fathom at only 26 years old, and at the same time, managed to cremate my father, plan a funeral, wipe out an entire home, tie up all financial responsibilities tethered to him, and return to work five days later. I am not irrational, unreasonable, unhinged, or uneducated. I do not come from a traditionally broken home, and I have always had a good head on my shoulders. Again, this is more than living in denial. This is more than saying my dad would never do something like this because he is my dad. The fact that outsiders likely see me as a weak-minded little girl, still in the throes of grief is not lost to me. I understand what I look like to literally every person not directly involved in this situation. I am more than asking for help here. I am pleading. As I stated yesterday, I am fully prepared to be wrong if I am. Nothing changes for me personally. But if I am right, it becomes less about clearing my father's name and my conscience, and more about preventing further chaos. It becomes more about stopping someone who is a potential serial killer from walking amongst the people who live in the very city that you represent and defend. It goes from being just a shocking story to a surface reality. If nothing else, it stops someone from continuously flying under the radar and forces him to be finally held accountable for the repeated turmoil he has been linked to and personally created over the last 10 years. There are countless people who have come forward with concerns, ranging from the various way he's echoed this story to hearing him blatantly admit to being involved. I just want the truth no matter what form it comes in, and whatever cost I must pay to get it. I have already followed and resolved more breadcrumbs on my own than law enforcement has ever afforded me, and I won't let up until someone answers for this, or it kills me, whichever comes first. Let me put it to you this way. We have two men in question here. One is labeled the murderer, and one is labeled the victim. The murderer has an ex-wife who's rallied behind his innocence since the beginning, two children he loved and adored, and an army of supporters that he's left in his wake. The victim has an ex-wife who has repeatedly tried to prove his guilt, two children that he's abandoned, zero supporters, and three dead girlfriends that he's left in his wake. Feels like a pretty easy judgment call to me. I look forward to hearing from the deputy chief by next week sometime. If I do not, I will follow up with you on Thursday. Thanks and have a great weekend. A user by the name Old Ladies Die Hard would comment this. Billy's initial reaction of having nothing to do with it, history of violence, finding another person dead at the bottom of the stairs, too many coincidences. There's probably something there. So keep digging, and definitely don't talk to somebody else's attorney without one of your own present. Good luck and keep us posted. We didn't get any more information from the OP for quite some time, but on December 15th of 2022, we got our fourth and final update. Okay, so sorry to have gone off the grid for so long. I have had a whirlwind of life-changing events. My father-in-law passed away in April. My relationship of 12 years ended in July and I have recently just celebrated the seventh anniversary of my dad's passing, so life has been both busy and hard for me lately. All right, on to what you're all here for. I know many of you are going to want to kill me for not having updated this information sooner, but I am still kind of wrapping my mind around it. So back in April, about two weeks before my father-in-law passed, my mom and I met with the deputy. He was surprisingly very receptive, kind, and understanding. A few things that happened in this two-hour meeting were both shocking and frustrating. He sat down with my mom and I, heard our plight, and then continued forward on his stance that to him, his team, and their evidence, he still feels strongly that the correct judgment was made on the case. He said he understood where my head was at, and definitely accepted some of the concerns surrounding Billy and the deaths of his other girlfriends. Of course, he said that he specifically remembered Billy from my dad's case only a few years earlier, but said that Billy was not receptive or helpful in the case of girlfriend number two. However, he said that the details I was given about girlfriend number two were not exactly correct. Yes. There was a second dead girlfriend around 2017, but he recalled a scenario where she drunkenly fell midday off of her porch as the result of some sort of aneurysm. 
He said this was universally agreed on by many on the scene given the fact that her body was just absolutely covered in multiple unidentified party bruises, both old and new. Those who were familiar with her attested to both her drinking problem as well as her constant injuries. And from their accounts, this was an accidental death caused by the woman herself. Although the deputy chief said that he found it extremely odd that Billy was so standoffish, he said that Billy was upfront about feeling like he was going to start looking like a villain instead of a victim. Still, I am not convinced, but the deputy chief is. He said that he definitely agreed that Billy is weird, very unlucky, and just an all-around strange dude in general. But he said he was about 80% certain that this was another circumstantial situation that Billy had found himself in. And again, he was questioned and free to go once they came to their conclusion. He said there just wasn't enough to go off of, and being weird isn't indicative of guilt. He was unaware of the death of girlfriend number three, as that happened in the city, and not the town the deputy chief is in. So he had no dog in that fight, but did raise an eyebrow when I brought it up. I don't know. It's not his jurisdiction, and there's really nothing he can do about it other than agree that it's suspicious. This one's the worst. I'm guessing that because I have been so involved with this, the deputy chief assumed that I had grown accustomed to the details of my dad's case, but as he was pulling files from my dad's case and making copies, he tossed a manila folder on the table that upon opening, had an 8x10 photograph of my dad's hands in his lap and a puddle of blood with the pistol still in his hand. My mom and I both audibly gasped. It was unreal. I still can't believe I saw that. I had done a really good job this entire time of having the luxury of assuming what this scene looked like without actually seeing it. This was the first time I had seen any photos of the crime scene at all, and it was very hard for me. It knocked so much wind out of my cells that I was pretty worthless after that. My mom carried most of the rest of the meeting for me. I explained to the deputy chief the multiple stories that had been circulating around Billy's constant retelling about how he found the bodies. Laying down, gun on the ground sitting up, gun in the lap sitting up, gun besides him, etc. It almost felt pointless by then because I had just quite literally seen a color photograph of the murder weapon in my dad's hand. But since I have had a lot of time to sit on those pictures, I almost feel more strongly that it looks staged. Before, I could only assume that Billy had staged the scene to implicate my dad. But even after physically seeing what should have been the proverbial nail in the coffin, it still didn't look, I don't know, right to me. It just didn't feel like a hand would fall so uniform the way it was. I was also startled by the amount of blood in my dad's lap. I was told numerous times that there was no need for me to identify my dad's body because they could easily identify him based on his ID picture. Furthermore, the bullet didn't even leave his skull and had to be extracted prior to his cremation. So it was very startling to me that there was what I would describe as a large puddle of blood in his lap. One more thing about all this is that due to the semi-consistent communication that I have with Billy's ex-wife, I explained to the deputy chief that he has more or less disappeared off the face of the earth. His wife was recovering from cancer. He hadn't paid child support in years. He wasn't present at his oldest daughter's wedding, etc. The deputy chief did manage to at least track him down to some extent and report him to the child support court. So his wages started being garnished and his ex-wife finally started getting a little bit of money out of him to support the kids that he ran out on. One semi-win in all of this, she posted a very sincere and heartfelt Facebook status about a little bird doing much of the footwork to hold him accountable. And we later and privately discussed meeting with the deputy chief. I have heard that recently though, she has stopped receiving payments again. For some reason, I'm back on believing that Sherry's brother has something to do with it regarding the money. I honestly feel like he talked Billy into this with the promise of a payout in the back end. Why else would her only biological sibling not give a literal fuck about his sister's house being covered in emergency vehicles on a Friday night? Something is off there, but I can't decide what yet. Rounding this out, I am sure I will think of other things that I have left out and or edits to questions from comments, so feel free to comment any concerns or thoughts you might have. Additionally, I am happy to upload and share any photos that were provided to me. I just don't really know what the rules are about posting those kinds of things. At this rate, I don't even care if Billy finds out about this or whoever else. I am so emotionally checked out about this whole thing that I really don't know what to think anymore. Thanks for being patient with me. Life is crazy. And that was the final update from the OP. I went to their profile to see if we could get any more information on what the situation is. The last comment from the OP stated that they are taking a break for an undetermined amount of time due to their last update being picked apart so badly. We probably won't get another update for a while, and from what we've seen, it doesn't look like the police department plan on reopening the case. So for now, this is where the story ends. I'm not too sure if this is bad police work, a criminal mastermind, or both. But the OP did do a really good job of gathering all the information they could and laying it out for us. Hopefully the truth about what happened to the OP's father comes to light and they are able to get closure from the answers they've been looking for, whatever they might be. But now that you have the info, let me know what you think down in the comments.
The first post I wanted to take a look at was uploaded onto the RBI subreddit on February 13th of 2023. Posted by the Reddit user preal420, it goes like this. A post on r slash confessions may have links to the Westside Park murders from 1985 in Muncie, Indiana. Hi, please remove if not allowed. Today I stumbled upon a post on r slash confessions. The OP had a throwaway and the post was just deleted less than 15 minutes ago. OP asked if he should turn in his neighbor who had confessed the double murder to him. Upon researching the little bits of information he gave, I discovered he was talking about the Westside Park murders that happened in Muncie, Indiana in 1985. I guess I'm asking if this post can be retrieved and traced back to its source. This seems very legit, but could be an elaborate troll. Either way, I believe it's something that should at least be looked into. In this section of the post, the OP provided multiple links back to the original confession, some of which were archived. But unfortunately, when I got to them, most of the links were broken. But thankfully, a user by the name Snow for their questions was able to find the same post that was uploaded onto the Raw Confessions website. The confession goes like this. I know the person who possibly committed an unsolved double murder. This by saying, I'm not entirely sure this is true, so take it with a grain of salt. My neighbor of two years is a retired Delta Force officer. He has been through some shit in terms of war and its ramifications as far as PTSD and paranoia goes. He can barely walk, and I work at a grocery store down the street from mine in his apartment. I do little jobs for him and get beers and cigarettes, stuff like that. So one day after I come back from the store, he starts talking to me about where he's from. Basically, he was an orphan because of unfortunate circumstances with his mother and father. He was adopted by two rich folks and basically moved to their house with another foster child that today he still calls his stepbrother. Anyways, this town he lived in and grew up in was your basic industry town and didn't have much to offer. Therefore, like most small town people, he resorted to drinking and doing drugs. Well, he tells me that when he was a freshman or sophomore in high school, he was hooking up with this one girl that he really liked. I'm not gonna give names, obviously, but she went to his school and was quite pretty and popular. In his words, she was the only girl I ever wanted to be with in high school, and I finally got my chance. Anyways, one day after they had an evening of fun, she left off to go back home, but this was the lie she told so that she could go meet up with a guy at the park. He proceeds to tell me that me and my friends happened to be at that park, and we see her in this popular guy that I fucking hated. Apparently this park is somewhat of a makeout park. Then he says that he went up to the car, shot her in the head with a 22, and then shot him in the chest so he wouldn't die, and so that he could sit there and bleed out in pain, and watch her die in front of him while I mock him. I kind of defensively sat there and went along with his bullshit, but then he brought out the evidence that he had grabbed from the car before him and his friends took off. Now mind you, I thought this was absolute bullshit. He is very straightforward, and I believe he's an honest guy. He doesn't bullshit, and really has nothing to lose considering he's dying of three different types of cancer. But I've never had anyone talk to me like this so intimately, especially something so real and crazy like murder. Fast forward two weeks from that day with him, I watched one of those unsolved murder docs on YouTube curiously, because I just wanted to see if anything he said lined up. I have to say though, everything down to a fucking T lined up. It only got worse when this popular documentary, viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, told me exactly the evidence taken from the car that I had just recently been showed by my neighbor. I don't know what to do with this information. Every documentary I've watched on the double murder has been accurate to show it was my neighbor, and now they all show the evidence taken from the car that he fucking has in his house after all these years. This happened so many decades ago and I truly don't know what to think of it. Why did he tell me that? Why would he make it up? Why would he have all these missing pieces of evidence that dozens of documentaries say is missing? My only thought at this point is for some reason he's really obsessed with this case and constructed all the evidence missing to make it look real. But even I know that's bullshit. He might very well be a psychopath, but he is far from a crazy fangirl. I think he genuinely told me the truth because at this point, has nothing to lose and I now know of an unsolved murder. How do I deal with this? Going to the police won't do shit and he has always been good to me and paid me a lot of money and also has helped me out of bad situations using his military connections. I'm not gonna believe I'm a bad person for holding on to this knowledge, but I genuinely want some feedback on what or how to fucking feel in these kinds of situations when you very well may be the person holding on to information that an innocent family has been searching for, for years. Please don't judge. I just feel weird about hearing this from him. It all lines up too well, but he's always been great to me. And like I said, it may not be true, but there are too many fucking coincidences. Now, like I said earlier, I got this post from the Raw Confessions website. 
but I wanted to look over some of the comments under the original post that was uploaded onto Reddit. Despite it being gone, the comments are still there, so this is a good opportunity to read some of them. If he's dying, he told you to clear his conscience. I think the victim's families deserve more closure than I think ignoring it for the sake of maybe not, or maybe so. So he has a piece of evidence that is exactly described in a documentary that already exists. I'd be skeptical, but if it is true, you should go ahead and report it. You posted about it on Reddit. This alone can already be forensically traced back to you. A few things to consider. He may be lying for many reasons. He wants to appear like a badass. He wants some attention, etc. And he may be telling the truth to clear his conscience. If he's telling the truth, then he probably feels guilty. If that's the case, then it may be worthwhile raising this issue with him and gently guilt tripping him into a confession. That's probably the easiest way to deal with the problem. He'll get free healthcare in prison too. If you inform the authorities and they act on the info, he may have only told you, in which case he'll know you snitched. And if he gets away with it, he's still dying with nothing to lose by committing a revenge murder. And if you wait till he's dead, you may be denying the family some sort of justice. A lot to think about. Good luck. In a final update to this post, the OP stated that they had contacted the FBI about this finding, but was still not sure if they were being trolled, which is definitely a possibility, seeing as this is the internet, and Reddit at that. Other Redditors also seem to agree with the OP that the confession's case could in fact be the case of Ethan Dixon and Kimberly Dowell, also known as the West Side Park slayings. Linked in a comment by the user Utah Mama 4 was this Star Press article detailing the incident. On a Saturday night in 1985, two Northside High School students were sitting at the front seats of a parked car in Westside Park when their lives were cut short. Ethan Dixon, president of the junior class at Northside High School and a debate team member, was shot in the torso. Kimberly Dowell, a junior varsity cheerleader who two weeks earlier had been elected to the court of the Northside homecoming queen, was shot in the temple. The window glass on the passenger side of the car was shattered. The events of that night have been poured over by law enforcement for years, but after no answers for decades, the families of the two bright young students may soon find some closure. Investigators have completed a two-year review of the notorious crime and said they are confident they have narrowed down to one person the list of suspects in the slaying of Kimberly Dowell and Ethan Dixon 29 years ago this month. The article mostly focuses on the investigation side of the story and even provides a sketch of what the investigators believe that the suspect looked like. Throughout the article, it is stated that investigators believe they may know who did the slayings, but a name is never given. They acknowledge theories of a rival classmate, drug dealers, and even wrong place at the wrong time. Police also ruled out that this crime was committed by a family member of one of the victims. This section of the article is where Officer Terry Winters describes the night he found Ethan and Kimberly's bodies. Winters said Westside Park was routinely part of his third shift patrols in the mid-1980s. He would drive through the park, sending the occupants of vehicles he most often found parked there on their way after the park closed for the night. That September 28th, Winters saw several vehicles and was preparing to clear the area when he received a call about a loud party at Colonial Crest Apartments, more than a mile to the west. The patrolman began to drive away from the park, but he never made it. As he approached White River Boulevard, he saw fresh tire tracks, which he followed, leading down a grassy incline to that gravel area not too far from the river. It was a portion of the park, west of the playground and picnic areas, where Winters very seldom saw vehicles after dark. It seemed unusual, Winters recalled. I wasn't sure what was going on. Winters approached Dixon's car from behind, his squad car's headlights shining into the parked vehicle. From behind, he observed people, but no movement in the car's front seats. The car's engine was running. The patrolman's initial reaction was concerned that perhaps its occupants may have been overcome by carbon monoxide fumes, but the gunshot wounds that killed the teenagers were immediately visible when Winters directed his flashlight beams into the vehicle. The article goes on to describe how the police closed off and searched the area. Commenters tried to find out who this mystery neighbor was, searching through old yearbooks from Ethan and Kimberly's class for somebody resembling the sketch, and even going through the list of Delta Force members, but eventually concluded that the neighbor most likely lied about being in the Delta Force. I did keep seeing the name Jimmy pop up, and many believe that he may have been the killer, though he has never been formally charged. A link to the Crime Capsule website has a section in which they had attempted to contact the man named Jimmy Swinley, who was in prison for an unrelated murder, asking him if he had done the slayings and why he had told people that he had, but Jimmy didn't respond, leaving everybody at a dead end. 
Inmates falsely confess to crimes they didn't do all the time, and to add to that, so do regular people. We don't have a name for the original user of the confession, or the neighbor, so everything is really just speculation. It could be that Jimmy and the neighbor are both lying about who the true killer is, and the real suspect is still out there. Or, one of them could be telling the truth, in which case I really hope that it was Jimmy, and not the neighbor, who is now telling the story while a free man. From that article, it sounds like they have a pretty good idea of whom did it, but not enough evidence to arrest them, and that it wasn't someone who went to high school with them. I'm pretty sure they're talking about Jimmy. Don't remember his last name. He's a dude locked up right now that they think did it. Only problem is, his DNA wasn't on the holster. Whoever took that gun most likely took it from the holster. Oh yeah, looks like the state got a DNA sample from him, and he may have previously told others he did it. He did. He's the genius that was quoted saying, I've already killed two people tonight. I'll blow your fucking brains out. Or something to that effect. His DNA didn't match the DNA found on the holster though. We could dive into the West Side Park case forever. But for now, this is where I'm going to leave it off. From what I was able to find, it seems as if the gun that was used in this crime is the missing piece of evidence. But there is a lot of discourse on what caliber it could have been. The Confessions OP stated that it was a 22, but some sources claim that it was a 380. Also, the Confessions OP never stated what this piece of evidence that their neighbor showed them was, so we really don't have anything to go off of from there. Could this neighbor be telling the truth? Or is he just full of it? and potentially obsessed with the West Side Park cold case. Information about the case is publicly available, so I could have learned these details at any time. Personally, I have no clue, but I am curious to hear what you think, so let me know down in the comments. Is this just an elaborate troll, or could this actually be the confession of a killer? This post is one that I found on the r slash paranormal sub. It was uploaded by the user Wigged Hiker Throwaway over eight years ago on January 9th of 2016, and our story is pretty interesting. Me and a friend found this creepy statue while hiking, and now strange things are going on. Anyone know what this is? Last weekend, my friend and I went hiking in Catskills, near Sundown Forest, and found this really creepy statue while fucking around in some caves. It has snails in its eyes, and a new surrounded snack. Looks like it might be old. I don't think it's been there very long, but it's weird because this cave was way off the trail. Somebody had a fire in there not too long ago. The OP also provided these pictures of the creepy statue. The statue really wigged me out, but my buddy decided to take it home with him, even though I told him not to. Everyone says there's devil worshippers that come out here to sacrifice animals and do their spells and shit, so I don't want anything to do with this thing. A couple days later, my friend calls me and tells me that he thinks the statue is haunted because it keeps moving from its spot and he keeps smelling weird stuff. Says he can't sleep at night because banging keeps waking him up. Now last night someone knocked on his door, but no one was there when he opened it. And he's super weirded out. He thinks he has a ghost because of the statue. It must be a coincidence, but I think he's actually scared. Before we go set this thing on fire, I wanted to see if anyone knows what it is. Anyone ever seen something like this? Or heard of a statue causing ghosts? User Freaky Links would comment this. Don't burn it. If there's something attached to it, all you're going to do is set it loose to attach to something else. You know, like you or your friend. You might have luck cross-posting it over to r slash occult and seeing if they can identify it. If you start to truly think you're being haunted, DM me and I'll try to point you towards someone who can help. Also. That shit is creepy, dude. Thankfully, it appears as if the OP took this commenter's advice because they would come back with two updates. My friend showed up here at like 11.30. He's out of his mind scared. Never seen him like this before. I'm going to do my best to remember everything he just told me because it was a lot. But long story short, he's sleeping over because something is in his house. We found the statue on Sunday. And like I said, I told him not to take it because it gave me bad vibes. But he took it anyways. He's been an atheist as long as I've known him, so when he told me something was going on, I thought he was just fucking with me because he knows I like to watch paranormal shows. It started out as just knocks and banging, but by Wednesday, he started waking up in the middle of the night, feeling like someone was watching. This kept happening through the week, and every time he'd wake up, he would smell a really strong scent like pond water. 
He doesn't believe in any of this stuff, so he just ignored it until a few days ago, when the statue moved from his desk into his living room. He says that every night since Thursday, it's moved into a different room than where he left it. He thought it was his dog moving it around, because it smelled funny, but his dog won't go anywhere near it. He said that she's actually peed in the house three nights in a row, and she's never done that. Last night, someone knocked on his door at 3 in the morning, but when he went to open it, there was no one there. His motion lights weren't on, and there weren't any cars in his driveway. He said that he opened up the door to look outside, and that's when he knew he made a big mistake. But he just felt like he shouldn't have opened his door. That's why I made this post in the first place. At that point, I didn't have any reason not to believe him, because it had gone way beyond a joke, and he actually sounded really, really fucking scared on the phone. He kept telling me that he was going to burn the statue because he knows that something followed him home. Anyway, he stayed up all night and then decided to go to the movie to take his mind off of it. When he got home, he said it felt like everything was fine, and he decided to finally go to bed. This is where it gets super messed up. He says that when he woke up, which wasn't until like 10, it was because his dog was barking like crazy. He said the pond water smell was stronger than ever, and when he went out into his hallway, he saw these muddy footprints everywhere. Not like shoe footprints, but barefoot. All of his doors and windows were locked, so there's no way anyone could have gotten inside. And sitting in the living room was a statue, which had moved again. He says that when he started to go near it, he heard someone breathing, like his grandpa, with the tracheotomy. He peaced out of there, and now he and his dog are sleeping in my guest room tonight. I've never seen him this scared, and he even started crying. I have no idea what to do. I believe him. He has no reason to lie about this because it's way too far to be a joke now. I know that everyone says not to burn it or whatever, so what the hell do we do? He wants me to go to his house to get the statue tomorrow, but I'm too freaked out to take it back to where we found it because I don't want to see whoever put it there. Edit 2. Sorry I haven't posted. Things got worse yesterday night, so we sent the statue to the guy in the comments today. So far so good. Thanks to everyone who actually tried to help and didn't just call us a couple of idiots. I don't know whether or not these events are true. If they are, it could be something completely unrelated to the statue, but it definitely is creepy. Luckily, the OP did say that they sent the statue to one of the commenters, and that commenter was a user by the name of Newkirk, who would offer to take the allegedly cursed statue off of the OP's hands in an effort to help them out. Hey, if you're too nervous to take it back to where you found it, I'd be happy to handle it for you. I see someone mention my email in the thread, but if you want to remain anonymous, just private message me, and I'll give you an address. Your friend made a mistake, and honestly it's not like he would know better, especially if he is a skeptic and atheist. This kind of thing happens all the time and gets fixed all the time. Don't freak out, don't burn it, and please don't throw it into a lake. A few things. Were there any personal artifacts near the figure? Jewelry, hair, cloth? You mentioned a fire. Did it look like there were pictures burnt in it? Was there a funny smell in the cave? Any markings on the cave wall? Symbols, paintings, graffiti? Any evidence of devil worshipping you've heard rumors about? Expand on the rumors if you can. Any details help. Does the figure have anything carved into it? Check the base. Does it feel heavier than it should? I've been collecting these kinds of things for a while now, and they're usually just trying to send a message. I wouldn't be surprised if someone put it out in the woods because they were too scared of it too. I know you've gotten some offers to sell it, and while I can't offer you any cash for it, I'd be happy to take it off of your hands so that it can be properly studied, documented, and hopefully understood. I can give it a safe place to live and guarantee that it won't be destroyed. Whatever you decide, you'll be fine. Just be smart, chill out, and think happy thoughts. Feel free to private message me if you have any questions, need a hand, or just want to offload the statue. If you are willing to divulge, I was curious to know how you store these objects, how you treat them when they come into your possession, what your overall collection of these objects is, and finally, what you think the anthropological background to it is. Thanks. Always willing. My wife and I have a room dedicated to storing these objects. Some of them remain out and on display, but there's the occasional piece that doesn't play nice, and they typically get their own box. If it's really bad, it goes into a special chest that gets padlocked. Then, there are a few that get special treatment, depending on, for lack of a better word, their personalities. Sometimes the objects come from a case we've worked on, sometimes they come from another investigator that can't house it, and sometimes, they're things that are sent to our PO box. When something new shows up, depending on its history, we usually put it in the living room for a trial run and see if it acts out or sends up any red flags. We'll monitor them, test them, try and track down their origins, etc. Over the last two decades, we've amassed a pretty decent collection of strange stuff, but some of the highlights include 
a scary mirror that has a bad habit of showing people some really nasty things, a voodoo idol that causes bad dreams to most people who touch it, a painting that likes to throw itself from walls, various puppets, dolls, and paraphernalia related to black magic, and even a plank from the actual Amityville Horror House. We do a dozen or two presentations around the country each year, and we started getting so many questions about the collection that we started bringing a few of the well-behaved items with us so people can see them up close. Other investigators can test them for themselves, and people can even hold them if they want, at their own risk, of course. The most important thing, though, is the mindset that we don't own these items. We're just their caretakers. We give them a place to live where someone tries to understand them, and armchair demonologists won't toss them into a river. We used to have a lot of issues housing this kind of stuff, but as soon as we stopped thinking about them as possessions, that stopped. For about half a year, the story ended there. But thankfully, Newkirk would come back with an update on the statue, and even provided a webpage that detailed the six months to which they had possession of the statue. I highly encourage you to check it out for the full story. This section details the first day that the statue was in Newkirk's home. Later that evening, while sitting in the living room watching a movie, Dana and I were startled by a commotion in the office. Thinking it was our two cats, I volunteered to break up the fight, only to realize upon walking into the office that the door had been closed the entire time. Nothing seemed out of place and the cats were now nowhere to be found. In fact, our feline familiars were in another room entirely, cowering beneath the bed, afraid to leave. I walked back into the office in an attempt to look for the source of the noises, but everything seemed in order until I almost stepped on Jesus. Lying on the floor was a plastic figurine of Christ, normally found nailed to a crucifix. As I turned him over in my hand, I realized that he was missing an arm. On the complete opposite side of the room, Swinging silently on the cross hung in the corner was Jesus' missing appendage. Something had not only managed to pull Christ from the crucifix without removing it from the wall, but it had thrown the figure across the room. I've still never been able to find the nails from Jesus' hands and feet, and sitting directly below the now desecrated cross was the crone. The crone is the name that was given to the statue. Since then, the statue has exploded within the paranormal community, and there have been many videos done about it. There is even one video where the statue apparently moves, though I will not play it due to copyright. I like this story because it started on Reddit and quickly became a sensation amongst the paranormal. Maybe Newkirk saw this as an opportunity and took his chance to capitalize on it. Or maybe the statue really is cursed. Luckily for Winged Hiker, they won't have to worry about it scaring their friend or them anymore. User Marble Bulldog 7 took to the RBI subreddit on July 17th of 2016 pleading for help in figuring out the identity of a person who is harassing them at their child's grave. How can I find out who is leaving creepy and threatening notes at my child's grave? I'm writing this post to vent, but also to see if anyone has advice on how to handle the situation. I'm located in Scandinavia, with rather strict laws concerning surveillance cameras, otherwise I would have gone down that path long ago. The situation? My wife and I lost our child to cancer one and a half years ago. Our child was then a toddler. This of course left us devastated and our way back from the darkness wasn't easy. We gave our daughter a very beautiful grave, and visiting it daily helped us through the grief. But then we started getting notes, written on a computer, not handwritten. Nasty notes about us, mainly me though. Sometimes threats, and also expressing hopes that the child my wife is now expecting also dies. Someone broke the wings off of the angel on the gravestone, destroyed the flowers, etc. I have no idea who this is. To my knowledge, I have no enemies, and neither does my wife. How can I find out who it is without breaking the law? Sometimes I get the feeling that perhaps it is someone closer to me than I realize. The reason that is, is when this first started, the notes always appeared in connection to us letting people know that we had been visiting the grave. If I went there on Monday, and for example posted on Facebook that I visited the grave and planted some beautiful flowers, that note would be there the following day. It felt like a pattern, but could have been coincidental. This is driving me insane. My wife, pregnant and sensitive as she is, can't visit the final resting place of our first child without fear and anger. I get very upset, of course, but I'm more infuriated. I want to know who is doing this. All advice is very much appreciated. Maybe one of you can think of something we've missed. Most people would just set up a camera and wait, but unfortunately for the OP, in Scandinavia it's a little more strict. In general, it is not allowed to use video surveillance outside of your own home or property. If you use video surveillance to monitor areas outside of your home or property, you may need to comply with the rules of the General Data Protection Regulation and the Swedish Camera Surveillance Act. I would say you can't just set up random cameras in the USA either, but it appears as if in Scandinavia, you could get into more trouble more easily. 
which is likely why the OP doesn't want to risk it. Luckily, the OP would follow with an update in the original post not long after. Update. Some have asked us to do a list of suspects. We tried really hard to think of anything that could be an issue, and this is what we came up with. L. In my previous workplace, L was a co-worker who claimed that I got promoted because I had a kid on the way and was pissed about it, but that was years ago. B. Before I met my wife, I dated B. We had a good relationship. I saw no crazy in her, but she wanted to have a child-free life, and I love children, so we parted ways, and it was a mutual decision. She also moved to another town, but since you guys have asked me to do a list of exes, I'll also do that. E. He is my wife's ex. She dumped him for me, but he is now married, so he should have gotten over that. V. When we installed our new kitchen, we hired a Polish guy to do some of the work. Sadly, language barriers made it hard, and we ended up having lots of problems. In the end, I had to let him go and find someone else to do the job. He was really angry, but surely that's no reason to stalk us now. C. C is not on my Facebook, but I'll list her anyways because she is a weirdo. She lived next door to us before we moved, but she had a very, very sick dog. So sick that it cried when it tried to walk. It was skin, bones, and misery on four legs. Sometimes it fell down and couldn't get back up. My wife reported that, and we never saw the dog again. C was a strange person. Not mean or nasty to people, but odd. And nurse say, she was the nurse at the hospital that treated our daughter. Also not on my Facebook. We made a complaint about her after finding out that she didn't give our child the pain medication at the right times, but waited too long to administer them. We weren't rude. We didn't shout or anything. We just wanted the best care for our kid. Also, when our child wished to go to the kennel and play with the puppies, we did that. But nurse say said we shouldn't because of our child's state. We went anyways and she was pissed for the rest of that weekend. This is all we can think of. Even if it wasn't 2016, it makes me sad that the OP and their partner had to go through this. But here, the OP gave us six potential suspects. Personally, I lean towards the possibility that it could have been one of the exes, as an ex would be more inclined to stalk and take it to this level, having already had that personal relationship with the OP or their partner. In a second update on the original post, we would get the first translation of one of the letters. Update 2. This is a translation of the latest letter from the 12th of July. I have translated it with grammar, spelling mistakes, sentence structure, and all. You should be glad that your child died, so she won't grow up with you both and live with you. It's better, and I wish the new baby don't live too. I hope your wife falls on the stairs and the ugly baby dies. It would be better. Company for your first baby. Maybe she eats something with razor blades and cut her belly open. I don't think that the child under the dirt here was a good person either. I think it was a bad person and she died because it was good that she died. I applaud it when people that are bad die and I have advice. Nine millimeter and your pain stop. Easy, easy. I am not evil, I'm normal and I do this because I like it and I don't like you. And I smile when I think that you're hating this. How do you like my arrangements on the grave? I like it much better this way. Don't be so negative. Eventually, the OP would give us another translation to another letter. I haven't had much free time today, chaos at work, but I translated one of the letters previously found on the grave on the 5th of May. I translated this one because it was one of the worst. Do you think your daughter is done and all rotten now? Does the naked bones shine pale in the dark? I think about it sometimes, and I hope you think sometimes about it. At least she won't be grown up like you both in the future. There is no future, only the end. And that is better. New baby will also be sick and die, and rot next to its skeleton sister, and they will all be dead together. I'll wait for it. It sings inside my soul when bad are suffering, and I feel triumph and happiness when it happens, and it is the best way. Wishing the worst for both of you. Soon it's coming. Do you guys think this is a male or female writer? How can one tell? User Reddit RW would say this in the comments. I'm no psychologist, but... This latest letter seems to not be written to you and your wife, only you. I doubt the person knows your wife well, but sees her as a symbol and a way to hurt you. Notice that harm is wished on your wife, but as a way to strike fear and suffering in you. There is nothing in the note that suggests the opposite, that harm will befall you, therefore making her suffer. This is someone who probably has to assert their normalcy. I would even guess that they have been seen by a professional based on the second to last paragraph. This is a person who is deranged. They can believe that small and even unborn children are bad and extrapolate that they deserve to die. I am not convinced this is a Facebook friend. This is someone who is really sick and knows your personal details. 
Have a look into the current circumstances of the Polish worker and the nurse. Has the latter lost her job and probably blames you? Has the Polish worker had a difficult time lately and in his mind blames his recent failures on you? I agree with another person on this forum. What does the spelling and syntax tell you? Native speaker, educated or not? It's hard to tell with the translation. The nurse was the first one that jumped out to me from the list, as it is a profession that allows a certain degree of power over vulnerable people. It can attract some really troubled individuals. And the withholding of pain meds is a huge red flag. In my opinion, I think checking to see if she is still employed at the hospital would be a good idea. I applaud it when people that are bad die. Seems a bit like someone who is either older or has seen a few deaths, which might be a vote for the nurse. I too was leaning towards the nurse, but it seemed to remain a mystery until on September 2nd of 2016, when the OP cross-posted on the r slash advice and the RBI subs with what may be the potential answer. Hi all. It's been a while since I updated, and that's because not much has happened. Also, the constant messages where people with or without providing an explanation feel the need to accuse and berate my wife got a bit too much. Some were written in a civil enough way, some not so much. Anyway, it's time for an update. Since many of you have asked and I finally got something to report, on the 27th of August, we decided to visit the grave together. My wife rarely goes there anymore in fear of what she might find. And as we are on the way to the place where you can borrow a vase for the flowers, fill the water and such, I spot a familiar face. It was C, our ex-neighbor with the suffering dog. Of course, she may have had a grave there to visit too, even if she doesn't live in the same town as us anymore. She must have arrived shortly after us and came walking in our direction, but slightly from the side. She was very suntan, as if she had just returned from a vacation and the moment she caught me looking at her, she turned around and walked out. I followed her, intending to talk to her, to see if she seemed rational or if she showed any sign of guilt. But she was gone when I reached the parking lot. This is no proof. I'm aware. I scanned the entire graveyard for the stone with her family name on it and found nothing. Our child's grave was not touched this time. This week I've been in contact with the office that can forbid people to keep pets if they have shown cruelty to animals in the past. Turns out that she had one of those issued to her. They did shortly after my wife reported the case of her dog, and it was put down. She had been warned before, but it was the dog thing that closed the deal, as I understand it. Motive enough, or am I being paranoid here? It's tricky. She could have a valid reason to be here, and walked out when she saw us because she disliked us, but it could also be more sinister. The top comment under this update came from a now deleted user. It seems to me that it very likely is the neighbor. She feels you took her dog, her baby from her and seems to be retaliating. I commend your wife for reporting the dog. I can't stand to even think of animals in pain. Your wife did the right thing. The neighbor was selfish and deluded by keeping the dog alive in such horrible pain. She could be selfish and deluded by doing this to you as well. There's no reason she should have left when she saw you otherwise. I hope the best for you and your family. We don't know for sure whether or not it was the neighbor, but this theory seems very likely to me as well. And as one of the other commenters said, this was likely somebody who already had problems. And like the OP had told us before, the ex-neighbor was already somewhat odd. The last update that we got on the situation was a comment from the OP that went like this. Thanks. Very helpful with the trip alarm system. Since we spotted C while visiting the grave, nothing new has happened. But we still think about it all the time. It's always on our minds. Who's doing this? And is it really over? We also worry that the arrival of our new baby may trigger a new response. So we make no baby posts on Facebook or any other social media. And we notice who we start to think twice about before telling people any information. My wife also refuses to visit the grave on her own. It's a really upsetting situation, but we're very grateful for the support. Maybe now that they were spotted, the OP's neighbor feared that they could actually get in trouble now. There are some sick people out there who will hold grudges and take being petty to the next level. I'm just glad that this nightmare is somewhat over for the OP. Let me know if you also think it was the neighbor down in the comments. Our first post comes from the RBI subreddit and was posted over three years ago on January 31st of 2021. The OP goes by the username Inside Fabulous and they detail a disturbing experience happening at their home when it gets dark outside. Knocking at my door at night. Throwaway account. The past few weeks, I'm woken up to knocking at my front door. My bedroom is very close to it. All that's between my bed and the entryway to the house is one wall. My bedroom window can see onto the front porch, but at such an angle that I can't see the door itself, only the space directly in front of it. My parents, whose bedroom is in the basement, don't hear the knocking. Neither does my little brother, but he's at the other end of the house. 
My sister is almost as close to the front door as I am, and while she doesn't hear the knocking, she has been complaining about not sleeping well lately. More details about the knocking. It tends to happen very late at night, or early technically. During the week, I'm in bed at 10 or 10.30, so I can be up for work at 6. Everyone else is in bed at the same time or shortly after. On the weekends, I'm up a few hours later, but everyone else's sleep schedules stay the same. When I go to bed early, the knocking seems to happen at around 12 or 1, but when I'm up late, it's not till closer to 3. This makes me think that whoever is knocking is somehow trying to get my attention. Maybe they even know that I'm near enough to the door to hear them better than the rest of my family. Maybe they're just trying to wake me up or interfere with my sleep. So they wait till I'm asleep? Just an idea. The knocking is fairly quiet. Another reason it might be targeted at me. It's loud enough to wake me up, but without filling the whole house. It doesn't seem to follow any pattern. Just a typical three or four knocks, like you normally knock on a door. I usually wake up mid-knock, making me think that whoever is doing it has probably already been knocking for a few minutes before I wake up. But that's just a guess, and I really have no way of knowing. Once I'm awake, it continues every couple of minutes, for 10 or 15 minutes, before stopping suddenly, sometimes even mid-knock. I've tried looking out the window to see who's out there, but whoever it is stays out of view from my window, and no way I'm going to the door to see who's there. I can see, however, that the screen door is being held open, so that they can knock on the wood door. It could be some prankster, but it's been happening for close to three weeks now. That seems like a lot of time and effort, especially so late at night, just to get no reaction. Before you ask, I'm going to buy a night vision camera if it doesn't stop soon. It's a lot of money, but at this point it's worth if it helps. And yes, I have told the police, but they say there isn't a lot they can do. They've sent patrol cars a few times, but they don't see anything. Those nights, the knocking comes late, but it still comes. They say they'll continue to help however they can, but they can't dedicate a unit to watching my house since they don't have any evidence of what's happening besides my testimony. If anyone has any ideas, please share them. I'm getting desperate. Whoever this is seems determined to torment me, and I'm helpless to stop them. I will take any and all advice. Thank you. Right away, this makes me think it could possibly be a boyfriend of the OP sister, and one user, Wizfrizz, would have a similar theory. How old is your sister? I suspect she may have a nighttime visitor, especially seeing the knocking sometimes stops mid-knock, and she has been tired lately. Otherwise, go and get your parents when the knocking starts, or sit up and watch until the person leaves so you can see who it is. This really should be an easy one to solve. She's about the right age, but she's extremely conservative and not at all the type. And if it were the case, the visitor would probably be knocking on her window instead of the door, because it's an easy reach. But she surprised me before, so I could be wrong and that could be what's going on. I'll have to watch for any signs of that. Someone else also suggested just watching to see when they leave, so that's what I'm going to do tonight. Hopefully, I'll be able to get pictures. Thankfully, the OP was already considering getting cameras, despite them being a bit expensive. User Iron Owl 785 would also offer this advice. Have you considered asking your parents if they will stay up with you? And A, witness the knocking? And B, open the door when it occurs? Sorry you're experiencing this. I can imagine how scary and frustrating it must be. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. If they hear it, I know I'm not crazy. And if they don't, then at least I know what's going on. I'll ask them tonight and post an update tomorrow. User Sonic Residue would bring up the possibility that this was all in the OP's head. Is it possible your mind is playing tricks on you? I used to experience something similar where I would wake up in the morning and I could have sworn I heard someone knocking on my door, but no one was ever there. It wasn't loud, but it seemed to happen regularly. Then I learned about something called exploding head syndrome, where people are awakened by what they think are loud noises, only nothing is actually there. I haven't read a lot about it, but from what I've learned, it sounds exactly like what I experienced. It's possible but unlikely, because it continues when I'm fully awake and alert. I can even get up and move around the house, and still hear it coming from the front door. Although I don't go near the front door for obvious reasons, it definitely could still be something psychological. I'm not going to rule that out, but it seems unlikely, because it meshes so well with the real world. The next day, after going through all these suggestions, the OP provided us with an update on what happened the night after writing their original post. So first, the boring stuff. I replaced the bulb on my front porch, as some people suggested. It's working fine now, so hopefully that will deter the person. I ordered the WISE camera, but it won't be here until the weekend. Me and my dad are also going to install a peephole in the door when we set up the camera. So, between those three things, the front door will be much more secure soon. Now, 
the interesting stuff. Last night, me and my dad both stayed up. He was in the living room, which the front door opens into. He had a clear view of the door, and he kept the blinds drawn and lights off so that it would look like he wasn't there. I was in my room, catching up on some college work I've been falling behind on since this whole thing started. All my lights were off, and my blinds were closed, so it should have looked the same as normal from the outside. The night was quiet, no knocking. So at 12.30, I decided to go to sleep. I went to tell my dad, and he said he'd stay up another hour just to be sure. Then he'd go get some sleep as well. At about 11.15, he got up to go to the bathroom. When he came back, he sat back down on the couch with a clear view of the door. As his eyes adjusted to the dark, he thought he could see something in front of the small window near the top of the door. When he looked closer, he realized it was a fucking person's face. He immediately grabbed his phone and called the police, staying away from the door. After a few minutes of talking, the operator asked him to look out the window again, from a distance, and try to describe the person, but they were gone by then. The police sent two squad cars over, one to talk to my dad, and the other patrolled our street and surrounding streets for anything suspicious. They didn't find anything, but they took my dad's story and talked to me as well. They're going to send patrols down our street at regular intervals throughout the night for tonight, and probably the rest of the week too. My dad didn't see enough detail for a suspect sketch, so all we have to go on is that the person is tall enough to look through the window in the door. It's about six feet above the concrete step in the front of the door, so the person is probably at least six foot five to get a clear look through it. Part of me hopes they come back and we get a better look, but part of me really hopes they don't. On the bright side, this rules out the possibility of it being animals, house sounds, or just my mind. It's definitely real, and the police are involved now, so I guess it's good to have a better idea of what's happening. But still, it's scaring the shit out of me. I'm generally pretty brave. I've wrangled loose venomous snakes and didn't break a sweat, but that's a threat I understand and can predict. I know what a scared animal will do, but I've got no idea what this prowler will do. I know how to catch and calm a snake. I don't have the slightest idea of what this guy wants, or what he'll do to get it. That's what scares me, not knowing what's next. I guess all I can do is go to sleep tonight and see what happens. Wish me luck. That definitely reminds me of one of those scenes from a horror movie when they turn on the lights and the killer is looking right at them on the other side of the glass. But unfortunately for the OP, this is not a movie. Like they said, this is real. User Breadpool would comment this. The fact they came back multiple nights and they're not knocking loud enough to get the attention of the whole house seems to me like they're casing your home, trying to figure out when you guys are asleep and if you'd wake up to certain noises. More than likely, just a simple crook looking for an easy break-in. Make sure you have all of your valuables locked up, just in case. And if your parents don't own, that they at least have renter's insurance. If the person saw your dad, then hopefully they know that you guys know they're coming around and will stop. That's honestly terrifying. Do you know if the person realized your dad saw them? I hope everything works out for you guys and you get to the bottom of this. Please keep us updated if you can. Good luck. That's what we assume happened. Obviously, no way to be certain. I'll continue to update every time anything big happens, but not too much so I don't spam. I think it could be possible that the OP's home is being cased for a future robbery. Hopefully it's not some serial killer looking and waiting for the next victim. But just like the OP said, they did provide another update. This one being the last one I was able to find. It went like this. Just a short update to let everyone know that I'm alright and to respond to common comments on the last update. First, here's what happened last night. I decided to sleep on the couch with a weapon handy because I felt that my dad deserved a break after last night. It was hard to sleep, but the window was covered, so I felt safe enough to eventually doze off. At one point, I woke up and thought I heard footsteps and her voices outside of the door, but I'm pretty sure it was just my anxiety and half asleep state playing tricks on me. No knocking or other disturbances all night, which is a huge relief. As for the camera, it's been delayed due to harsh winter weather in my area, so I decided to just cancel the order and found one at a store nearby. I couldn't figure out how to set it up, but a friend of mine who's worked on security systems before is going to come and take a look later tonight. It should be working fine before I go to bed. A lot of people suggested asking friends or neighbors to help us catch this guy. That's a great idea. I talked to my neighbors. Most of them don't have surveillance cameras, but those who do will see if they can find anything. One of my friends, the tech guy who's helping me with the camera, is going to set up camp for the next night in his car across the street and down a way so it's not obvious he's watching our house. His girlfriend will be there too, so hopefully two sets of eyes catches something. 
Last, I want to quickly address some specific comments. I'm not telling anyone to attack them. I'm not trying to get people riled up. I just think these people make good points, and I want to talk about it. Here's the first. You think with everyone having a camera on their phone, somebody would have recorded something by now. How convenient that they haven't, and that the one camera is not here till the weekend. Parentheses. Will never be mentioned again. Nah, I'm sure this isn't fiction at all, guys. It's true. It does look weird that I don't have any photos. But remember that this happens late at night, past midnight, and this person has shown they're smart enough to avoid detection. I'll have a camera set up tonight, so if they come back again, I'll get some evidence. And of course, you guys will be the first to see it, after the police. The next comment is actually a short chain. It's not that long, but it's too long to paste in, so I'll just summarize. If anyone wants to read the original chain, it's on the last post, but please don't treat this person like shit. Basically, they say that everyone is taking this too seriously for how little evidence I've provided, and that's a completely valid point. I can't prove any of this right now, so why should you believe me? I probably wouldn't, honestly. Right now, the only evidence I have is what I've heard and seen, and what my dad saw, neither of which I can conclusively prove. I'm hoping to get some real evidence tonight. Until then, I suppose you're completely in the right to be skeptical. That's all. Since there was no knocking last night, I'm really hoping there won't be any tonight either. Maybe being spotted scared the guy away. Who knows? I'll update tomorrow or the next day, depending on what happens. Thank you all so much for your support. I've read some of the comments to my family, and we are all so grateful for your help. It really means a lot to us. Like I said earlier, this was the last update, so it's likely that the knocking stopped and the OP had nothing else to say about the situation. The top comment under this post came from the user Opun says me, and it reads like this. I wonder if your dad spotting him may have spooked him, and he might stop coming around for a while. I would be willing to bet anything that he'll eventually start back up if that's the case. Either way, I hope it just stops altogether. Best of luck, and keep us posted. I feel like this is likely what happened. Whoever that person was probably noticed that the OP's dad had spotted them and decided that whatever they were planning on doing was not worth it anymore, now that the occupants of the home were definitely on high alert. Whatever it was they were planning, I'm glad the OP and their family didn't have to find out. And I really hope that this prowler didn't set their sights on a new home with different occupants. On September 2nd of 2022, a Redditor came on to the RBI subreddit asking for advice on why their neighbor was having their Amazon packages delivered to the OP's door. My neighbor is having their Amazon packages delivered to my apartment. I was wondering if someone here might have an idea of why my neighbor is doing this. I need to start out by saying that the lamination or whatever is covering the walkway outside of my apartment door is loose and peeling, so it's very noisy when you walk on it. It's literally impossible to walk over it quietly. My girlfriend and I try to sneak into the apartment if we know the other is home, but we are never able to. I work from home most of the time, so I'm usually home when packages get dropped off. A few days after my neighbor moved in, I heard another set of footsteps approach the door very soon after the packages were delivered, then walk away still trying to be quiet. I thought someone had stolen a package, but after checking with my girlfriend, nothing was missing. This kept happening two or three times a week, always on weekdays. The problem is in the afternoons, when delivery drivers get to our complex, I'm usually on Zoom calls for work so I can't get up and go to the door to see what's going on. I do know it's always Amazon packages, as I can see the delivery truck parking spot from the window next to my desk. Around two weeks after it started, I was not on a Zoom call when I heard packages get dropped off. I saw out the front door window that it was our new neighbor taking the packages. By the time I got dressed, he was back in his apartment, so I knocked on the door and explained the situation and asked if his packages had been delivered to our apartment by mistake, but he said he had no idea what I was talking about. I brought it up to the landlord, but after hearing that we weren't missing any packages, he just shrugged it off with a, huh, that's weird. I called the local police station. The officer I spoke to said I could come to the station and file a report if I wanted to, but there wasn't much they could do, especially since we weren't missing any packages. He seemed to think that it was just the Amazon driver delivering to the wrong place. A couple days ago, I happened to be free and near the door when I heard some packages being dropped off. My girlfriend and I weren't expecting anything, so I knew that the neighbor would be coming to pick it up. I looked out the peephole, and sure enough, less than a minute after the packages were dropped off, he came walking up. I opened the door right as he was bending over to pick up the package. He looked at me, grabbed the package, and started walking very quickly back to his apartment. 
I asked what he was doing taking a package from our doorstep. He said he had brought up the package from his car, even though I literally just saw him take it from our doorstep. He wouldn't stop to talk to me. I followed him and asked to see the package, to see who it was addressed to, and what the apartment number was. But he kept saying he had brought the package in himself. He went back into his apartment and wouldn't answer his door when I knocked. In hindsight, I should have taken the package before he arrived to look at the shipping label and forced him to knock on my door and ask if I received the package. I'll be doing this the next time I'm able to. I'm confused as to why he's doing this. I've chatted with him a few times and heard him chatting with other neighbors. He doesn't strike me as someone so socially awkward that he couldn't explain that his packages kept getting delivered to my apartment for some reason. I thought that he might be getting less than legal things delivered, so he didn't want them going to his address. However, the packages are always delivered by Amazon Delivery. I could be wrong on this, but I think that anything delivered by Amazon Delivery is fulfilled by Amazon themselves, so it's not some possibly sketchy third-party delivering. Is there something I'm missing here? No real harm is being done, I think. But not knowing why he's doing this is bugging me. Right away, I had assumed that the neighbor might be buying drugs online. But what the OP said about Amazon is true. If the neighbor was buying drugs, or any other illegal things, going through Amazon would definitely be a lot harder than going through another delivery service. But even if the goods are legal, the fact that the neighbor refuses to send them to his own apartment might indicate that he is purchasing these goods with less than legal methods. And the top comment under this post appeared to lean towards the same theory. I think your neighbor is scamming or stealing from someone. My mom gave a scammer remote access to her computer. He walked her through it step by step on the phone. Then they snagged all of her accounts and passwords. They ordered from Amazon and Target and sent the orders to different addresses. The Target rep she talked to said that it was a common scam and that the scammers won't use their own address. This is a very tricky situation because even if it's getting delivered to the OP's home, it is technically a federal crime to open up somebody else's mail. So even if the OP suspected that there was something illegal going on, I don't think they are legally able to open the package to find out. Thankfully, after receiving advice from many commenters, the OP provided this update on the original post. Thanks for all the advice, everyone. It's much appreciated. I've contacted my landlord as well as the company that owns the apartment complex by email and let them know what's going on. I went to the police station and filed a report as well. I let my boss know what's going on, and they gave me permission to step away in the middle of our Zoom meetings when I hear packages being delivered, so I can grab my neighbor's package the next time one is dropped off in my apartment. I plan to contact my city's post office on Monday, but I don't know if this falls in their jurisdiction, since Amazon is the courier. I will make an update post when I learn more. The OP did make an update post 20 days later, and despite it being short, I think it definitely provides more insight as to what the OP's neighbor could be up to. Hi all. Sorry it's been a while without an update, but nothing much has happened. After I made my previous post, my neighbor had two more packages delivered. I'm guessing he had already ordered them and they were in transit when I caught him red-handed taking a package from my doorstep. The packages had different names on them. Neither of them matched the name my neighbor gave me when we introduced ourselves. He didn't come to my door looking for the packages either. I kept them, but I didn't open them. One box was small and light, and the other was larger and fairly heavy. I'm guessing it contains multiple items. As I mentioned in an edit to the post, I had filed a police report on the situation. I was contacted earlier this week by my local police department, and a detective came to my apartment complex to ask me some questions. He wouldn't give me any solid answers to the nature of the investigation, but he was clearly very interested in my neighbor. I'm guessing my neighbor is suspected of some form of fraud, like many people have suggested in my previous posts. I handed off the two packages mentioned earlier to the detective as well. So that's where things are right now. Nothing big or exciting going on so far. If anything else comes up, I'll make another update. Everybody in the comments seemed to agree that the OP's neighbor was more than likely a scammer. Other people's names that weren't your neighbors? I'm 98% sure they're using stolen credit cards and using your address because it's more convenient. Some girl I used to work with back in the day did this. Her old job somehow gave her access to all kinds of card numbers. She'd order things and get them delivered to an abandoned house across the street from her. She said she'd do about 10 different cards a week. Sometimes it was just gift cards. Other times, it was packages. I'm not entirely sure why she told me about it, to be honest. If I remember right, it was kind of randomly mentioned, too. Scammers like this usually steal people's credit card information and use it to buy expensive things. Because usually, it's a lot easier to purchase goods and resell them than to directly take money out of the victim's account. 
we wouldn't get another update for about two months. And unfortunately, it looks as if the neighbor caught on to the fact that he was being investigated. So it's been a bit without any new info. However, today, I heard a commotion outside of my door and stepped outside to see my landlord and the maintenance guy at my neighbor's door. The landlord was pounding on it for a good five minutes, but my neighbor didn't answer. The maintenance guy opened up the door and they went inside. I waited around for a while until I could catch the maintenance guy alone and asked him what was going on. He said that my neighbor hadn't paid this month's rent. So the landlord went to collect, but he wasn't there. It looks like he skipped out on his lease and moved out. The maintenance guy said he didn't take everything, but he definitely moved out. I don't know how long he has been gone. Other than the times he came to my door to pick up packages, he was a very quiet person. I don't have any updates as far as the criminal investigation into my neighbor goes. I haven't been contacted by the police, and I don't know if it's really okay to just call them up and ask them about an ongoing investigation. I guess that's all we're going to get from this mystery, unless there's some way in California for citizens to stay updated on police investigations. Thanks for all the interest, and sorry it's been long since the last update. User out of my element 1445 would comment this. Former California deputy here. So first off, probably nobody is investigating this, unless it's something on someone's radar. Probably too many variables, and I can guarantee you that that detective has a massive caseload to deal with and can't go chasing ghosts. It's California. Every single agency is way understaffed. There is a ridiculous amount of crime, and none of it gets prosecuted, so the motivation for investigating things is not really that high. Unless you live in small town Farmville, where the local detectives don't have much to do, I would not expect much to come from it if you're living in any type of metropolitan area. You could try to call him, and he might try to tell you it was nothing if it was, but he's not going to tell you anything intricate if there is a crime. I did have a case once where somebody was getting packages shipped to their apartment addressed to them. They were getting paid like $10 per package to forward them off to a third party. It got really complex really quickly, but basically, it was some identity theft stuff from Eastern Europe where people were ordering things off of the internet with stolen credit card numbers, and then the guy was forwarding the packages to Eastern Europe. It was basically creating a buffer. He didn't know he was committing a crime, he just thought he found an easy job taking packages to the post office and shipping them off. But it's definitely bizarre, and I would take one of those packages the second it showed up. I'm not saying it's not a crime, I'm just saying it's California, and it's probably not going to get looked into. If what this commenter is saying is true, then it is likely that the neighbor got away, but at least they're not getting packages sent to the OP's house anymore. I checked the OP's profile to see if they've been keeping up with the case, but found nothing. And seeing as this was over a year ago, they've likely moved on from the situation entirely now that they don't have to worry about it. Hopefully, like with many stalking cases, this is all being documented, and if the neighbor is still scamming and gets caught in the future, this can potentially be used against him as evidence. I found these posts on the r slash paranormal sub, and it reminded me a lot of the crone from a previous video. So, I decided I would check these out as well. I originally found the post from the user Trash Panda, but upon looking into it, discovered that these dolls had originally belonged to another Redditor, a user by the name Just Chilling Like That. We'll start with their post that was uploaded on July 10th of 2023. Hey, I was at the Goodwill looking for items, and I came across these porcelain dolls. They had a sale that anything with a yellow sticker was $1.50, so they both had yellow stickers, and I picked them up. For two weeks, I left them in the back of my car, and didn't think anything of it. After that, I took them into my house, and four days later, weird stuff started happening. My dog standing in front of the closet they're in, weird thumping noises, and the TV turning on and off. Then, ever since they have been in my home, I've been having really bad nightmares about a doll, and her name is Mary Judge. I never get to see the doll, only the real woman whose name is Mary. Something about these two dolls is there, and real, and I'm ready to get rid of them but I want to make sure they can return. I don't want any attachment. Can anyone suggest a way to safely dispose of these dolls? Here are some pictures. Mind you, I don't know which one is the one that's haunted, but I'm assuming it's the doll with the longer black curly hair. These are the dolls. This is where Trash Panda comes in, who likely saw the post and was curious to see if these dolls were actually haunted. Hey, was wondering if I could buy one of those dolls. Yes, of course. When I'm out of work, 
I'm going to post it on Etsy. I will send you the link. I figured that's the best way to get rid of her. Thank you so much. No problem. I'll send the link as soon as I post tonight after work. Shortly after this exchange, Trash Panda came onto the RBI sub with their first post about the dolls. Under the assumption that most of you don't have a clue about this, here's the backstory. A post was made here on r slash paranormal about two dolls the poster originally bought at Goodwill. They were meant to be a gift for one of his cousins who collects dolls. He stated that he would hear knocking, his TV would turn on and off on its own, and he started having nightmares about a woman named Mary. His dog would also whine and block the closet that they had been stored in. Thus, understandably, he really didn't want to gift them anymore. A lot of people wanted the dolls, and I got lucky and got both of them. Now, we don't know which one of these is haunted, but I unpacked them as of 20 minutes ago. I will be updating this post as things happen, but please feel free to give any insights. I have a feeling about one of them, but we'll withhold info. Also, we'll be doing research about when they were made. All I know is that one is definitely handmade, and the other one may be as well. Obviously, aside from receiving the dolls, not much happened in this post. But thankfully, about a month later, Trash Panda came back with an update. First things first, for all who don't know, I bought two dolls from another member of this community. I got them, I'd say, 20 to 30-ish days ago and placed them on top of my fridge. The previous owner stated that he didn't know which was haunted, as he got them at Goodwill at the same time. The goal, as a skeptic of haunted dolls, is to see if anything happens and do some investigating. And nothing has happened. Until today. I came home from work and was changing. Then my husband called me into the kitchen to look at something. He didn't say what. I walked in and he was staring up at the dolls. That's when I noticed that the Russian doll was turned to the side. He asked if I did that and I said no. He said the same. Now you might be thinking, okay, they're on the fridge. So opening and closing the fridge probably jarred them. Nope. The other Wimbledon doll has not moved. Not even a fraction of an inch. Both dolls were firmly on their bases. The Wimbledon doll appears to be looking slightly more to the left, but that's because the photo was taken at a slightly different angle than the original. However, the Russian doll has considerably turned. My husband restraightened the Russian doll, and we assumed that we'd wait and see if she moves again. And y'all, not even 10 minutes after he moved her, my fire alarm starts going off. I have lived here since January, and the alarm has never chirped, beeped, nothing. It has never made a sound whatsoever, yet here it is, instructing my family to evacuate because there's supposedly smoke in the family room. We checked everything, changed the batteries, made sure the stove was off and there was no smoke. We don't vape, don't smoke weed or cigarettes, no one showered recently, and I wasn't cooking. I also checked the alarm for spiders because I read that they can set a false alarm. It went off again twice after we put it back up, but has been silent since. So this part is just oddly coincidental. I'm realizing as I'm writing this, that since I got them, I have not been able to sleep. I can't figure out why, but I just can't sleep before 4am, which is not like me at all. I've also had a few really, really bad nightmares, like my mom getting mauled by a bear. My husband has also said that I seem irritated with him more than usual, and all of that is the opposite of how we were before I got them. Trash Panda also included these pictures. Seriously, put a live webcam next to her. The internet shall watch her for the next year. Do you live in an earthquake slash tremor prone area? Maybe check the center of gravity of the doll. We do sometimes feel rumbles from Cali. I'm in Vegas, so I'll keep that in mind. I didn't think about that. I'm working on getting something like that set up. I'm just not sure how any of that works or how I do it. Just saw the third picture. OP, could you be pregnant? Something to consider. I'm not pregnant. But that's interesting you say that, because I'm two days late. Sorry for TMI. But all tests are negative. I'm chalking all that to my hormones and birth control as I'm on the patch. The commenter was referring to the third picture, which was a screenshot of the conversation that the OP was having, where they stated that they felt sick as soon as they got home. The dolls are here. Okay, we'll figure out times to be there. Oh shit, lol. I might have to call out. What's wrong? I feel so sick to my stomach all of a sudden. And the dolls just came, hmm? Like I'm on the verge of throwing up. Kind of like when you get dizzy and nauseous from food poisoning. You shush, lol. Okay. 
That's not good. And it's as soon as the dolls got there? Yeah, my head hurts. So far, these events are weird, but I wouldn't say this is clear evidence that the dolls are haunted. It is the next update, however, where things start to get a little bit concerning. The first update was posted 19 days ago. Since then, the Russian doll has moved yet again. We took the coffee machine down, and it's just the dolls up there now. I meant to put them on a shelf instead of being on my fridge still, but I've been so busy with work, school, and life. And to be honest, it really just hasn't been a top priority. However, me and my husband were talking today, and both of us have been hearing a little girl calling for us. I told him just a few hours ago, that a couple days ago, I heard a little girl say, Mom? I replied with, Hello? But no one answered, and I was the only one home. Not only that, but none of the neighbors in my building have kids. My husband was like, that's so weird, because I heard a little girl calling for her dad. He even went downstairs to see if the neighbors below us had a niece or any kids over. Nope. So we just had this conversation and told me why I feel this stingy feeling on my side slash belly. And I look down, there's a scratch running from my left side all the way around to my right side across the front of my torso. I'm talking a scratch that's probably at least 12 inches long. My first thought was that it was my pants, but it's too high for pants. And the pants I was wearing were leggings with a soft waistband. I think it's time for these two to find a new home. So many people thought I was crazy for wanting to wait for more hard evidence. This is good enough for me. Thoughts? These are the pictures of the OP scratch. Of course, there were some commenters who believed that this is all in the OP's head, such as the user Independent Nature 893 Your brain is actually focused on this supposed haunted doll, and you believe so hard on this that your brain makes some strange things happen. In fact, nothing strange happened but now. With this focus on your mind, your brain will try to explain everything that happened in a paranormal way. That's why you can think you hear the noise like the scream of a child who says mom or dad, depending on your construction. All sound, all behavior that you've never heard before or paid attention to will be explained and interpreted by your brain in a paranormal way. For the scratch, it can easily have happened by anything. Your clothes, jewelry, a piece of furniture, animals. Relax, take a break. The dolls are harmless. The OP would respond with this. You're also playing wrong though. We don't pay much attention to the dolls at all, to the point that we can't pinpoint the exact date they moved or what day we heard the voices. Neither of us have any clue, because 90% of the time, we forget they're even there. Us noticing they moved has been random chance. I saw many commenters saying that selling the dolls would only cause them to torment other people, so I don't know what the OP plans on doing to them. There have been no more updates on any paranormal events or news of the dolls being relocated. So for now, this is where the story ends. I am curious to hear what you think though. Was this all just coincidence? Could something paranormal actually be attached to one of those dolls? Or is this all in their heads as a result of hyperfixation? Then again, if you're brave enough, you could try to contact the OP and maybe check the dolls out for yourself. That's the first story we're going to look at. Happened very recently and was uploaded on November 30th of 2023. A concerned Redditor by the name Unhappy Machine Spirit would come onto the RBI subreddit with this post. Found an abandoned car in the woods and looked like something bad maybe happened. I found an abandoned 1999 Honda Civic in a forest on the Nevada-California border. Normally I wouldn't think much of an abandoned car, but it just kind of looked like something bad happened. The trunk was popped and items still inside. These items were a box of diapers, a sunshade for a pram, an infant-sized winter jacket, a plush toy for an infant, and an open envelope for a paycheck from a business in Reno. The envelope has a name, address, and employee ID number on it. There was a baby carrier in the back seat, which luckily only had some trash in it and not a baby. The other things in the car were just some food and drinks trash and a sock that was baby-sized. All the baby stuff was pink and girly, so I assumed that the baby was a little girl as well. The name on the envelope was a female as well. The car had the license plate removed, the lights and the radio removed, as well as the back tires removed. Outside the car was an empty box of diapers. 
a high heel hanging from a tree with a sole torn up, and the matching shoe across the clearing on the ground. Also, I mound the fresh dirt between the shoe tree and the car. I took photos of everything and wrote down the VIN and the name and address on the envelope. I wandered around the surrounding area of the forest a bit more, and I found a pile of women's clothes strewn about on the ground maybe a hundred feet away into the tree line. These clothes weren't winter appropriate. Looked like it was underwear, a bra, and some shorts. Seeing the clothes started to give me some worry for what may be the situation with this car if it's connected. I ran the VIN number through an online search, and the number doesn't come back as reported stolen. The other things that unnerved me were that everything was dry and mostly clean compared to the surroundings. We've had consistent rainfall, and the ground was muddy yet the diaper box on the ground was dry. The cardboard didn't seem to have been rained on or anything, or even absorbed much water from the mud. The contents of the trunk were also dry, and fairly clean, which seemed wrong given the fresh mud and consistent rain. The exposed metal from where the tires were removed also hasn't rusted yet. The car was also neatly parked in a clearing, and not on the road, like it got stuck in mud or snow. I called this into the police, gave them photos, GPS location, and the Forest Service road number, but I've heard nothing back. The county this forest sits in is pretty small, so I don't know if the police have the resources to even check the car out. Given that the car seemed to be freshly left there, and the child is involved, I want to get some closure that whoever this belonged to is okay, and this is just a stolen car left in the woods. Does anyone have any advice on what I can do to get more information on what happened? I will admit, this forest has always given me unnerving vibes, so maybe I'm reading too deep into this, but I do want to make sure nothing worse happened to whoever owned that car and the baby. Definitely an eerie discovery. It has all of the makings of a true crime story. Other Redditors would express their concerns in the comments as well. You might consider contacting the employer and letting them know you found some of this woman's belongings, including a pay stub, but don't know how to reach her. Then pass on your info in case she wants to get in touch. If you do this, I wouldn't give it too much detail about how you found it in order to protect her privacy. Depending on the size of the company and the person you speak to, they may just disregard your call entirely. But if she stops showing up to work, your call could raise a red flag and prompt them to report the issue to the police as well. You could also send the letter to the address you found. I know some people think it's dramatic to continue following up, but I agree that you probably won't get closure. I would rather exhaust my resources than just let police handle it, knowing that they may not look into it at all, even if it is just a stolen car. I'm sure this person would like to know where it is, and there's no guarantee the cops will contact them especially if they didn't report it missing for whatever reason. This is a great reply, and I love that you thought of protecting her from accidentally saying something to her boss that could get her in trouble, or expose something she needed to hide from them. Because describing the actual situation in whole is definitely not the call I ever want my boss getting. I don't know what could end up with my stuff in such circumstances, but whatever it is, the last thing I need is my boss knowing and having to explain to them. This is all really good. Thank you. The company she worked at is pretty big, one of the big players in Reno, so hopefully they do care. I feel the same about just letting them handle it. The county this car is in is small as hell, so the local PD may not even go out and look. Plus, even Reno PD might not see it as priority. Ultimately, I just want the owner of this car and her baby to be safe, or in the worst case scenario, help further finding out what happened. I will admit, I don't know a lot about how someone living out of their car may leave the car but it didn't appear like she was living out of it. It just had baby stuff and some food and drink trash, like wrappers and cans. Unless someone stole what she had in there and left the baby stuff, it looks not very suitable for living, but I could be wrong. It's also rather far from civilization and would be a mile long hike just to get out of the woods and probably like 15 more-ish miles to the business that envelope had. By no means is that not doable for someone, but it would be very difficult especially as it is higher in elevation and gets below freezing and snows up here regularly in the winter. Luckily, it didn't take long for the OP and the RBI to get the answers, because the next day, the OP came back to the sub with an update. I have good news, y'all. This was luckily the best case scenario, and my update is mundane. With the help of others with far better detective skills than me, we were able to track down the individual's Facebook page 
This has been confirmed to be the individual who owned the car. She is safe, and her child is safe as well. She's active on Facebook and I contacted her with the information on where the car is. She had posted about it getting stolen in early September, and no one else had stumbled upon it and told her until I did. Thank you to everyone who helped guide me to find her and help her find her car. I'm very happy this was just a creepy find and nothing more than theft. And that's that. Case closed. It still fascinates me how easily Redditors can find people, especially when they work together. This is part of the reason the RBI sub is so popular, and also part of the reason the internet can be very terrifying as well. This post comes from the user today on Reddit Planet and was posted onto the RBI sub on June 28th of 2023. It goes like this. How likely is it that there is something to this blocked off section of wall in my parents' home? My dad's always told us that when he signed the closing of the house, the seller winked and said, hope you find it and I hope you make a lot of money off of it and then just left. Both my parents said, wait, what? But he hurried away, no idea. That was in 1992, and that story comes up now and again. Last time we talked about this, we ended up ripping out part of the wall in the stairwell, just out of curiosity. This time, we're talking about cracking through a bricked over wall in the basement. According to the town records at our library, our house was standing before they started writing these things down in the 1860s. My dad specifically remembers going there, searching for it, and finding that information. Recently when we looked again, the records were gone. The librarians and historians don't know what happened. It's an old house, too old to even have the classic Michigan basement. The basement is a stone box with a crawl space in the back corner. If you follow this crawl space, climbing over and under some of the house's framework, you end up at a cistern. The top of the cistern is covered with an iron dome that's up against the bottom of the floor, so we have no idea what's down there. We've found several odd things in the crawl space, pieces of ancient petrified leather shoes and rib bones. I had these in my toy box growing up, and I'm trying to hunt them down again. If I do, I'll post pictures. Across from the entrance to the crawl space is a brick hole similar in size. In the yard behind this section, the grass dies in a line going downhill towards the town. In one spot, some of the yard has eroded away to reveal a bit of cement. My unconfirmed theory is that this is connected to the Underground Railroad. Downhill from us in town is the house of my childhood friend. His basement has tunnels similar to mine that were confirmed to be a section of the railroad. Did I read too much Nancy Drew as a child, or should I look into this? The OP stated that their house dates back to the 1800s, which could line up with the theory of it being associated with the Underground Railroad that according to the National Geographic Society website, occurred between 1810 and 1850, so that adds some validity to the theory. I definitely think it's odd that the realtor would say that to the OP's father, assuming that it did happen. I know that many realtors do intentionally keep information from some homes such as deaths, crimes, and other not so appealing events in an effort to close the sale without scaring off their buyer. But I think if this home was part of such a big historical event, then why hide it? If anything, I would think that the home would be more valuable. It just doesn't make sense to me that this is what they were hinting when they said, hope you find it. And there's also the bones and the shoes, which together hidden inside a crawl space paint a dark picture, but could still completely be unrelated to each other. A commenter by the name Regular Al would comment this. One thing you might want to think about is researching the property records and then doing searches for the names of the former owners in the local newspaper. While I doubt you'll be able to find a headline like eccentric millionaire announces hidden booty in home, you might get some hints. Arrested on suspicion of theft, former owner went on a trip to somewhere exotic, etc. Are any of your neighbors older or have been there for a long time? Have you asked any of them if they've ever heard any rumors about your house or former owners of it? Or maybe consider the possibility that y'all got trolled? The OP would reply back with this. Just got the house records. There's two names on there that aren't from my family. One of them is dead, but female, so not the man my dad bought the house from. I'll start looking into the other guy and see if there's a possibility I could speak to him. Edit. My dad said the man he bought the house from is long dead. Going to look elsewhere. 
Unfortunately, since both of the past owners are no longer with us, we're kind of left with only one option, and that is to go inside of the crawl space. And that's exactly what the OP did, because soon after their original post, the OP came back with this update. Thought I'd add an update to my post last week. Sadly, there's not much to share. We inspected the brick wall more thoroughly, moving shelving units and such. Looking at where the support beams of the house rest, the wall was definitely put there to reinforce the frame of the house. I don't know the technical lingo, but I'm assuming they had to replace something and rebuild it, and use cement and bricks. There was at some point a crawl space behind this wall, under the front porch. After talking about it, we realized that the people who reinforced this wall would have had to have filled the space with sand or cement because there is cement under the porch. And what 1800s farmer would take the time to reinforce a cement slab to keep an unused crawl space open instead of just filling it in? Just speculation. But it seems more likely than a chamber of treasure or skeletons. I went into the crawl space. Fuck that thing. It took me a couple of days of mental preparation, as I'm severely claustrophobic. And I've been terrified of that hole in the wall since I was a kid. It's absolutely filthy. It's a dry, dusty dirt floor space that was filled in with vermiculite and cellulose insulation. I army crawled through dead mice, poop, and hot insulation for about a half hour, trying to keep from panicking, and couldn't even get close to the cistern unless I squeezed through a web of electrical wires and crawled through a one-foot space. I'm a petite person, but wasn't up for it. I could see that I wouldn't be able to turn around if I made my way up to it, so I decided to call it a day. I did find a piece of dog pelvis, which explains the rib bones. I found more shoes. I'm no shoe expert, but they seem old. Anyone who knows shoe shit might find it interesting. The previous owners of the house are dead, and I couldn't dig up anything about legends of treasure in the area, so sorry Reddit, just an old house, and my excitable imagination. These are the pictures that the OP included in the update. I am glad to say that the bones weren't from a person, and although the OP wasn't able to make it all the way to the end, I did look up what a cistern from the era would have looked like, and it would have looked like this. While we don't have confirmation that this was at the end of the crawl space, it seems likely, and honestly, with how old everything is, it was probably better that the OP couldn't get all the way in there and potentially risk getting stuck inside. A redditor by the name History Nuts did comment this, which could give us some sort of explanation about the origin of these leather shoes. Those shoes date back from the 1800s. The one shoe with the many buttonholes comes from a lady's boot like the first one on this page. The other one is a man's shoe, with two holes made from a gross grain bow, like this shoe. It also seems like the shoes are leather, and probably punched by hand. In all, it seems like you probably found concealed shoes especially if the space was sealed up afterwards. This commenter linked a Wikipedia page that gave us a bit of information about an old concealed shoe custom. In the past, people would hide shoes and other charms around their homes in an effort to protect the building's occupants from demons, ghosts, and witches. Obviously, this was superstition, but it was a fairly common practice. Looking at these shoes, they appear to be the same style as the ones people would hide so this theory could be plausible. As for the dog bones, maybe a poor dog accidentally made its way into the crawl space and got stuck. The OP was suspended at the time of making this video, so I was unable to find out any more information about this crawl space. Though from what I've seen, I believe that the OP has gotten their answer and has likely moved on from this mystery. In the end, only the house knows the secrets hidden behind the walls. This post was uploaded on August 25th of 2023 by a redditor with the name Ashen Necromancer. Ten armed cops showed up at my door. For a bit of context, my husband and I bought this house last month. The owners were in a pretty big rush to get out, but my realtor explained that the house had been on the market three times and twice it fell through. The owners were moving out of the country as the woman had just gotten a job in the UK and her father was ill. She signed the papers a week before we signed. According to my realtor, her father took a very hard turn and was on his deathbed, so she needs to get out before he passes. 
This all happened last Sunday. I was getting ready for work when there was a knock at the door. My husband and I weren't expecting anyone, but I ran downstairs and answered the door. Standing there was one cop on my porch, standing out of view of our video doorbell. Around the corner of the porch were four more cops, hands on guns. Poking out from behind the gate to my backyard were another five cops, also hands on guns. Needless to say, I was scared shitless. The cop at the door started asking questions regarding the old owner of the house. The conversation went something like this. Good afternoon, ma'am. Is the old owner here? Oh no, she's not here. Do you know when she will be back? Oh no, she's not coming back. She doesn't live here anymore. And what is your relationship to the old owner? None. I just bought the house from her, that's all. How long have you been here? About a month or two. Back in the beginning of July. Do you know where they went? Not really, no. I believe she left for the UK, but I don't know for sure. All right, well, sorry for bothering you, ma'am. Have a nice day. I still had my video feed up from the doorbell, and I just heard the cops go. She's fled the country. The cops stuck around for about half an hour before they all left. I have no idea why the cops were there looking for the old owner, and I have no idea if they will be back. I'm not sure what to do at this point, if I just leave it alone or what. I'm confused and concerned. A bit of a note, we have security cameras installed. I think the cops knew about this prior to coming. There was an undercover officer present, and the cops knew where to hide in the blind spots of the cameras. They came through our neighbor's yard behind a big pine tree. The cameras picked them up as they were moving in front of our cars, but then they hid in the blind spots. One Redditor would say this. Can you check the clerk of courts for any violations against the previous owners? I have checked the public records online and didn't find anything of note. A couple of traffic violations from eight years ago, fines for missing court dates that were paid off, and then a charge for not having her dog registered or vaccinated for rabies. But that charge was also paid off. But I think I'll give the clerk a call tomorrow to see if there's anything recent. Thanks for the advice. Honestly, I would say that the OP is lucky to be alive. Had this been a swatting style police confrontation, there's no telling what could have happened. Part of me feels like the police could have done a bit more digging, seeing as how the OP had been in their new home for a whole month already. But another part of me feels like they were at least a little aware, given the conversation they had with the OP and that they just needed to confirm while playing it safe. This all obviously hints that maybe the previous owner's rush wasn't because of an ill family member and instead an effort to evade the police. Thankfully, we would get an update about a week later. Hello, RBI. I apologize for the late update. I wanted to take time to allow my emotions to cool and collect as much information I could on the situation. Nothing is definitive at this point, and there are speculations about the situation, but I believe I have come up with the answer that makes sense, at least to me. I met my neighbor last week as her package was sent to my house instead of hers. We started talking and it turns out she was the original buyer for my house, but backed out on the last minute before the contract was finalized. She told me that basically everything my realtor had told us were lies. We were told that my neighbor went no contact for no reason and just bailed on the contract. However, her reason for backing out was due to the modifications the owners had made to the house. There is a strange structure in our garage we assumed had been used to hang sporting equipment or things of that sort. However, we now believe that it was used as a growing operation for pot, which is currently illegal in my state. When my neighbor was looking at the house, she had a video of her going into the garage and there was a box fan strapped to the roof above the structure, as well as lights in that area. Up in the structure, trusses and the support beams for the roof have been modified and cut in order to accommodate the lights. There is also a hookup for water in the garage, which seemed rather strange. The owners tried to claim that this was left over from the original owner of the house, but I'm not so sure I can believe that. Why would they leave it up for 12 years if it wasn't being used? My neighbor was looking at the house back in March, and from what she said, the family was living in a hotel at the time, yet all of their furniture was still there. Beds were still up, and there was an air mattress laid out on the garage floor. Neither of us understood why they were living in a hotel, rather than in their home, with all of their furniture. If the law was after them, however, it would make sense. The garage being a growing operation also accounts for our janky electric. It has since been repaired, but during the job, the electrician had mentioned that a lot of the power was being diverted to the garage. My husband had to awkwardly explain our theories. In any case, much of the damages to the house because of the grow operation were never disclosed to us. 
Lawyers have been contacted and we're seeking legal action against the realty company. We have been advised it might not be a good idea to go after the old owners, as they may no longer be in the country. There are no assets we could go after. I'd still love to give the old owners a piece of my mind, as they have been nothing but shady the whole time we were buying. I am still salty over something they did the day we bought the house. TLDR, they broke into the house and took stuff that legally belonged to us after we finalized the sale. Again, a lot of this stuff is speculation, but these are the answers that make the most sense at the time. Despite this just being the OP's theory, I do believe this could be the answer. At least hopefully it was just a grow lab, and not a chemical drug lab. Going back to the last story we covered, I think these serve as lessons to always research the history of the home you intend to buy, and don't just go off of what these realtors say. Tons of damage could have happened in this situation, and that's not the only potential risk. We have the police that we've seen here, and even possible criminal activity for those who had known what was happening in the house before a new family moved in. And what if the owner didn't move out of the country? There's just so many possibilities, and unnecessary stress on the OP and their family, in the place that they should be able to feel the safest. May the Lord have mercy on his soul. I grew up in cemeteries and have been exploring them since I was about six or seven years old. As a result, I'm always on the hunt for interesting gravestones. When I was about 13, I wandered up to the furthest point of St. Mary's Cemetery in Windsor Locks, Connecticut to discover the gravestone of a man named James Mulvey. I was struck by the fact that his grave was at the furthest corner of the cemetery, isolated from the other graves, with no family members to speak of. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that his grave bore the inscription, May the Lord have mercy on his soul, and it left quite an impression on me when coupled with the aforementioned factors. Additionally, I have never encountered a grave where the individual was born in a different country and died in a different state from where they were buried. The impression proved to be lasting because I went home and did as much research as possible though it yielded little results. Eventually, I let the matter go but every now and then the memory of this mysterious figure would revisit my imagination, to the point where I visited his grave during my honeymoon trip when I was 23, and I'm sitting here today at the age of 27, in a final ditch effort to solve this mystery. The enigma compounded a few days ago when I decided to independently revisit my search to find an article from the pilot, a Boston-based newspaper. This clipping only intensified the urge to finally satiate my curiosity since it solidified that this man appeared to be as mysterious in life as in death. Why was he not speaking with his family? How did he acquire a substantial parcel of land? Why was he unmarried? Why leave Boston for Virginia? Why did his sisters who supposedly resided in the Springfield area of Massachusetts decide to bury him in a teeny tiny hockey town known as Windsor Locks without any relations? I have tried to the best of my ability to locate any further records, but I've been unable to do so beyond what I have attached. The newspaper clippings concerning the Stevenson's regiment and subsequent owed wages are speculation. I am unsure whether or not this is the same individual particularly since the owed wages article was dated November 1858, which would be four months after his death. It is likely that the individual posting was unaware that he was deceased. The heirs wanted ad would have been posted just one month after the wages ad. I am unclear why I cannot find an official death record, criminal record, land deed, marriage record or any official indication placing him in either Virginia or the Boston area. I thus humbly enlist the sleuths of Reddit to please help me solve the mystery that has been nagging at my soul for the past 14 years. Who is James Mulvey? And what in the heaven's name did he do or not do? Was he an enigma in life as in death? Or am I just crazy? This post was uploaded onto the RBI sub by the user Vanguard Denk J9 on December 5th of 2020. This is the picture of James Mulvey's gravestone. The OP also included these links to articles from old newspapers that could shed some light onto who James Mulvey could have been. Heirs wanted. Whereas a man by the name of James Mulvey died in this place last summer, leaving three sisters, namely Catherine, Jane, and Mary, somewhere in the United States. But as he supposed at the time of his death, they lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. I have written there several times but can hear nothing of them. They have probably moved west. Said James Mulvey was a native of Leitrim, Ireland, and has left a considerable property for the benefit of his sisters. Now, as administrator of said James Mulvey, 
I offer a reward of $20 for the first person who shall give me the address of all, or either of those three ladies, so that I can find them out. And another article. Notice to all, extra pay, bounty land, pension, and other claimants against government, whose claims have been rejected or suspended, or not yet applied, will do well to notify us, as such claims that have been abandoned by other agents have been successfully prosecuted by us. Children of deceased soldiers who were under 21 years old on the 3rd of March 1955 are entitled to land, as well as all who were in battle before that time. Address Lloyd & Co. Claim Agents, Washington, D.C., 15th Street. The whereabouts of James Mulvey or heirs, Sergeant and Colonel Stevens, New York Volunteers, Mexican War, is wanted. There is an old belief that people who take their lives should be buried outside of the gates of the cemetery, or at least in an isolated part of it. It seems to me that the wisest would be to talk to the employees of the cemetery. Based on the archives, they will have the most complete information about who at least took care of this person's funeral, because he was buried with a good headstone. This way you can expand your search to his friend. You should also contact the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center. They should have the largest amount of information about New York volunteers, date, and on the basis of their enrollment in the service. Just be sure to clarify when you ask questions that you're talking about James, who served in Group F, because in Group A, there was another native of Ireland, Sergeant Robert A. Mulvey, and there is some info about him there. These people may be related too, or their same last name may have puzzled people who were looking for James. As the article says, his sisters were already married and did not live with him. Most likely, James died on the trip, and not one of his sisters took care of his burial. Even if he had an excellent relationship with his sisters, in those days, communication was simply too difficult, and establishing the fact that they were living relatives would have taken too long. If you have time, try browsing the articles in the town's library. Maybe an obituary was issued for his death. This will help you know if James lived there or was passing through. I only suspect that he may have taken his life. All great information. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's no longer easy for me to visit the town or the library, as I no longer live anywhere in the area. I was hesitant to believe that he served, since it was not noted on his headstone. Thoughts? He definitely served there. I found him at a couple 1st Regiment rosters. He was Company F, Cavalry Sergeant. This may be coincidence, but this is highly improbable due to matching age. Based on all the articles in which a relative either claimed him in the search, or someone looking for him or his relatives. So we have at least two independent searches for him. It is likely that he somehow died on the trip and was buried in this town but nobody knew about it. If his death was sudden, and he was buried on the basis of documents available with him, then it's not surprising that this epitaph looks rather vague, and he was buried far away like a stranger. On the other hand, the tomb has an Anglican or Catholic cross, and a hymn, but this could be assumed based on the place of his birth. The OP would later provide us with this update. New York Arrival, 1844. Sister Catherine's Arrival, exact same arrival date, ship, origin, place of departure, and most importantly, family identification number. Based on her being 40, I imagine she was a widow or a spinster and thus remained unmarried. Another missing friends ad, September 1858. It states that he has left considerable money to his heirs. And the second James Mulvey, who died on September 1858, also born in Leitrim, albeit 15 years younger or so. Amazing coincidence. I researched the phrase, May God have mercy on their soul, and found this Wikipedia page that stated, May God have mercy upon your soul, or May God have mercy on your soul, is a phrase used within courts in various legal systems by judges pronouncing a sentence of death upon a person found guilty of a crime that carries a death sentence. I'm in no way saying that James Mulvey was a criminal, but I do think that this just adds more to the mystery of who he really was. Update, December 14th, 2020. The response I received after contacting the cemetery, in which I am notified that there is no additional information available beyond what his gravestone says. On the same day of this update, the OP made a separate post with a little bit more information. The majority of the feedback on my post advised me to contact the cemetery which I did. I received my response this morning, 
and it solidified my worst fear. I cannot understand why there wouldn't be any information available particularly concerning who erected the stone. I feel that I am out of place to look, and this mystery has done nothing but compound itself. Presently, I am fairly certain that he isn't actually buried in St. Mary's, due to embalming being relatively uncommon practice prior to the Civil War. So perhaps his body is elsewhere, and we will never know. I have attached photos of his isolated grave courtesy of the clerk who supplied them. At this juncture, I am left with more questions than answers. I have spent the past week scouring the internet for hours, and have procured nothing aside from the arrival of his sister Catherine, and their joint presence on the Chester ship. I am curious for theories regarding why there is no information available at the cemetery, as well as any speculative theories in general, since I feel a genuine resolution is impossible. Okay, this is a long shot, but interesting. I searched newspapers.com for James Mulvey in 1858, and found that in late June 1858, there was a James Mulvey arrested with five others on the charge of mutiny, which carried a death sentence back then. I have not been able to find much more about the mutiny other than those few sentences. The ship was based out of Boston, Massachusetts. It ended up sinking in 1861 off the coast of Australia. There are later articles out of New York in November of 1858, which ask for the family of James Mulvey to contact the government about his owed sailing wages. If your James Mulvey was a sailor who was put to death for mutiny, it might explain some of the different locations. If you would like me to share copies of some of the articles with you, just PM me. Oh wow, that's absolutely fascinating. The timeline of death also adds up. I will admit that I saw a lot of references to a James Mulvey in Australia, but ignored them due to the distance. I'm not sure if the government would still be willing to provide him with wages and land after he committed such a crime, but I don't know the legalities of the period. I am also not sure why it would be alleged that he died in Virginia. I'll definitely shoot you a message. Thank you so much. I tried looking for the mutiny articles. Not even the Wayback Machine had any archived. Fortunately, it looks like the OP was able to do some research on their own and discovered this. Update. December 15th, 2020. A helpful Redditor sent me these articles regarding a mutiny aboard a Boston-based ship. I am attempting to find records of a possible execution since the individuals were arrested a month before James' death. The mutiny is almost certainly a different James Mulvey due to the prisoners being released in September 1858, two months after our James' death. If he died in prison, I'm sure it would have been mentioned. And if not, there is no reason for his site of death to be listed as Virginia and not Baltimore, Maryland. Another Redditor would comment this. The biggest problem I ran into was the sheer number of people named James Mulvey, even multiple ones born in 1820. I could never hook up his sisters with any degree of certainty. In fact, I could never confirm any of the documents to definitively be about him with any degree of certainty. In professional genealogy, one is taught to locate multiple sources for the same information before claiming someone is a certain someone. I was not able to find any one source that I know was accurately the James Mulvey which we are looking for. This, as well as the second phrase on the stone, caused me to think that perhaps he had been dishonorable. Perhaps he was executed. I just don't know what to think. Sadly, it looks like the mystery of who James Mulvey was remains unsolved. And with his name being so common, coupled with the fact that record keeping was not as advanced back then, it looks like we may never know. It really makes me think about all of the stories the gravestones can tell from those who are no longer with us. Our first post comes from the r slash internet mystery subreddit and was posted by a now deleted user on November 24th of 2020. What happened to user shady business 15? Was he fake? Was he actually being spied? In 2013, a Reddit user by the name ShadyBusiness15 posted an image of a component of their damaged extension cord on the subreddit r slash what is this thing. He explained that the extension cord had violently blown a fuse, and after taking it apart in an attempt to discern what had happened, he found the mysterious device. The image posted of the device showed a SIM card attached to something that many users on the subreddit pointed out was likely being used for surveillance. The user then proceeded to move the investigation over to r slash RBI, seeking more information. People there were quick to point out that the device included a microphone and was almost certainly being used by someone to monitor the user. What remains a mystery to this day is who was spying on Shady Business. He claimed his parents were adamant that they had nothing to do with it. 
and without a warrant, they were unable to find out any record of the calls made by the device. He was never heard of after this. What might have happened to him? The OP also provided links to Shady Business's posts, starting with the one on r slash what is this thing that was posted on April 30th of 2013. Finally blew a fuse in my extension cord, took it apart to see the damage, and found this inside. This post was pretty straight to the point and included a link with multiple pictures of what appeared to be some kind of device inside the extension cord. Everyone in the comments definitely seemed to believe this was some kind of listening device. Your extension cord is a room bug. Somebody calls the phone number on that SIM and the extension cord auto answers and listens to the room. Spooky. I've googled it and figured it's some kind of spying device, but any ideas on how I can get more information about how it got there and who put it there? Shady Business also cross-posted this onto the RBI, where commenters were able to provide links to the exact same device that was inside their extension cord. It's a GPS tracker with a cellular uplink. Why is it in there? Mm hmm. Edit. As others have found, this unit, the 900D, does not in fact have GPS according to the manufacturer. The 908D does. Looks like the seller here just copy and pasted the description. So no university studies on the migratory patterns of wild power strips, unfortunately. As user Jetrink found though, there is a microphone. So this is definitely a covert listening device. These commenters are talking about the SIM 900 card. The link to the Alibaba page where you could purchase this was thankfully gone. But with the Wayback Machine, I was able to pull it up where we can see they come from China and are sold from a seller named Mrs. Lucky Chen. There's two to three days shipping and scrolling down, we can see all of the tech specs and even antennas. If we read the product description, SimCom presents an ultra compact and reliable wireless module, the Sim 900D. This is a complete quad band GSM GPRS module in a SMT type and designed with a very powerful single chip processor integrating AMR 926 EJS core, allowing you to benefit from small dimensions and cost-effective solutions. Furthermore, the SIM 900D can be compatible with SIM 340DC. Featuring an industry standard interface, the SIM 900D delivers GSM slash GPRS 850, 900, 1800, and 1900 megahertz performance for voice, SMS data, and fax in small form factor and with low power consumption. With a tiny configuration of 33 millimeters by 33 millimeters by three millimeters, the SIM 900D fits almost all the space requirements for your M2M applications, especially for slim and compact demands of design. I know this might sound like gibberish to some, myself included. So I looked up what GSM and GPRS meant, according to this website. The term GSM is an acronym for Global Systems for Mobile. It is a type of cellular standard for communication over mobile devices. It caters to data delivery and mobile services by making use of digital modulation wherever SMS has an effect on society. The term GPRS is an acronym for General Packet Radio Service. It is basically an upgradation of the features of GSM. It allows a user to obtain a much better speed of data and provides them with simple and wireless access to packet data networks as compared to the standard GSM technology. I personally have never heard of a power cord that needed any form of cellular service. So we can safely assume that this is in fact a listening device. But as to why it's spying on shady business, is still unknown. Maybe he bought this device on accident from some kind of garage sale or a secondhand shop without knowing this device was inside. But maybe someone either gave it or planted the device in shady business's home without their knowledge and they unknowingly integrated it into their life. Fortunately, we did get a second update from Shady on May 1st. Update slash info. Went to sleep last night and woke up to being r slash best of. And now, top of the subreddit. Thought I'd post this thread to give you guys updates and clear anything up for people who haven't seen my comments. First of all, here are all the pictures I've taken so far. For the people wondering what inspired me to open up the extension slash power strip in the first place, I had to wait for maintenance to reset the fuse in my room, and it took them about two hours, so I wanted to see the extent of the damage. In regards to suspicious helicopter parents, it's still not ruled out, and not sure if there'd be anyone wanting to spy on my parents. Law enforcement is unlikely. I don't think I'm that interesting, and it seems to be something you can purchase readily online. 
The SIM card is currently in an old phone, but no phone calls yet. I'll provide any updates on that front in here. Any more suggestions are welcome. SIM card forensics tools, or even just suggestions on where else might be a good place to look in case there's any similar devices around. Thanks for the comments, everyone. Like Shady said, a lot of Redditors seem to believe that his parents could be behind this. Have you called and asked your parents if it was them? If not, do it. Tell them you found the bug and are seriously creeped out. Explain that this is their one chance to admit it before you contact the cops. Tell them that you are going to pursue the case to the fullest extent of the law. If they didn't do it, they have no reason to lie. If they did, that should scare them into admitting it. If they don't, and you go to the cops and it is them, they deserve to be punished. Tell your parents you're having a party in your room around midnight. I bet they will call the SIM card. This post was soon followed by an update as well. I called, and an automated message said, This service is now closed, and if you have voicemail, you can turn it on. Nothing interesting. Didn't get the last number called in. I created an account on the O2 website, and the only information I got is that there has been no top-ups in the last three months. I called O2, and they said they could not give me an incoming call log. Would need a warrant, but I don't want to get one. Is there any way to get the incoming call logs off the phone? Also, how does the six months no outgoing calls charges means the activations of SIM work? As I left for uni in the beginning of October, and it's now May, but when I put the SIM in the phone it worked. Is that possible, as no one had made any outgoing calls? Or did it reactivate for me putting it in the phone? Extra pics of the possible microphone. These are the pictures of the microphone. Whatever is going on is very weird to say the least. And what makes things even weirder is that not long after this, Shady Business's account just stops uploading completely. There is the possibility that Shady just locked off and did not return to Reddit after getting the answer they needed, but the timing of everything just adds to the mystery. The last comment Shady made came from this thread. You do need to establish the history of that particular power strip. Was it bought secondhand or borrowed from someone? It's possible that the bug was intended for someone else and it's nothing to do with you or your family and just happened to end up in your possession through being lent out or mislaid. Yeah, it is. SIM card is in a phone to see if it rings. What happened? Check the number on both parents' phone. Wasn't stored, so nothing right now. After this, shady business goes completely dark. Now, back to the new post asking about shady. The top comments under this one went like this. Honestly, not sure how standardized surveillance equipment would be across the world, but common sense tells me that if he posted this then vanished, the most likely scenario is probably him being in prison right now. Maybe not in prison, but something definitely not good. He did not even ask his parents about it. Or anyone, in fact, but just disappeared. I also don't think anyone would go that deep only for some internet points. If his parents had fallen prey to industrial espionage, why did he never ask them and update us? If he actually contacted someone who knew about this and told him to get off the internet and not write any more posts about that, why did he leave his account and those posts behind? And someone buying transmitters, a SIM card, and microphone, then assembling them in an extension cable and blowing the fuse then opening it up, taking lots of pictures only to get upvotes on Reddit is extremely close to impossible. His disappearance is the only wrong thing in the first theory. It has now been over 10 years at the time of this recording since Shady posted online. And with no answers, we can only hope that he just moved on. But if he was being spied on, I wonder what for. Maybe he was doing some illegal activities that he didn't mention. Or maybe his parents were just that overbearing. And hopefully, him discovering the device didn't trigger some form of reaction from whoever it was that could have been on the other end. Now, I know every family has drama, and some more than others, but there's nothing like suddenly unlocking a memory and discovering that you might have a long-lost twin sibling out there, an experience that a now-deleted Redditor would share with us on the RBI subreddit on January 4th of 2021. I think I have a twin. First, I want to share some suspicions I have. Second, I know this will sound like the plot of the parent trap, Please don't write me off. Let's start with the basics. Dad left when I was three. From what I've gathered, it was a non-violent yet ugly situation of loathing between the two. Mom has only talked about it once, and I suspect she regrets telling me. 
I am a 24-year-old male, by the way. My earliest two memories include a girl. In the first, we're in a room in my maternal grandparents' house, deciding that we're shy and don't want to talk to people. So when they ask our age, we simply hold up three fingers. I never forget that moment, partially because I think it's the first time I've ever held up three fingers at the same time. But she was there. A girl. I've ruled everything out. My grandmother's peers, neighbors, none of them had kids at that age. There's simply no reason for this girl to exist. She's in another memory, a similar one, probably from the same time. This was one I forgot until recently. I work in marketing now. There's an old sports center with two soccer fields slash hockey rinks and a gym. In addition, there's offices, old arcade games, a place for concessions, and a daycare center. They've been closed for a while, but we're planning a big upswing pre-COVID. Our agency was going to give them a push, and I visited a little under a year ago to take some stills. As soon as I walked in, the memory hit me. My grandmother dropping us off at the daycare center inside. Us. I remembered it so vividly. Most of the lights were off, so the indoor fields looked like a dark ocean. The gym lights were on, and she must have been going to physical therapy. And she dropped two of us off. I know it was the girl from my three memory. It stuck with me, but I didn't chase the thought. It just must have been some girl. After all, there's no pictures of her, and no family member had ever brought it up. Then again, it's the exact same situation with my dad, whoever and wherever he is. Could he have taken her and my mom got me? I want to pursue this because one of the last things my grandmother ever said to me before she passed last fall sent chills down my spine. She was talking through the window of her home and I was masked up, keeping a safe distance. She knew things were winding down and her mind wasn't very sharp anymore, but she said, you've grown so much. You were so small back then. Both of you were. I instinctively replied, both who? But she recoiled from answering as she remembered not to say anything. We helped clean her house after she passed away, mom and I, and I dug through some photos, photos I'd never seen, but they didn't tell me anything new, except for the same girl in the background of three of them. She's in the swimming pool, running in the park, and searching for Easter eggs at church. Is it her? I don't know. There's no pictures of my dad, and if they wanted to keep my potential sister a secret, I can understand she wouldn't be in any, but would it be possible that my grandmother kept some, or she was slightly in the picture, whether intentional or not? What should my first step be? Talk with my mom? I don't know. I don't want to seem crazy to her. I have a stepdad, but we're not close since he came into the picture when I was a preteen. Who knows if he knows anything? I imagine my dad and sister are out there somewhere. Do you think I have enough to support that belief? I can't even begin to imagine what must have been going through the OP's mind. If that were me, I would definitely be freaking out. The top comment came from the user squirrelgirl313 with some pretty straightforward and simple advice for how the OP could get their answer. Do you have your birth certificate? There should be a box indicating if it's a birth of one child or multiple. Some of the replies under this comment went in both directions, with some redditors stating that their twins' birth certificates mentions nothing about them being twins, and others saying their birth certificate does identify that they are twins. I could not find anything that either confirmed or denied if birth certificates usually state that info, but from what it looks like, I would say that it depends on the region. Regardless, the OP would provide an update stating they would check the certificate to see if they could find anything out. Update. First thing I'm working on is my birth certificate. If it tells me I'm one of one, I'll casually ask my mom who the girl in the photo is. Thankfully, it only took the OP five days for them to come back with an update and an answer to the mystery. Can't thank everyone for the support and for the overwhelming agreement that I should pull my birth certificate. Once I had free time to do so, I got the copy. Sure enough, I'm one of one, no twin. The girl from my memories and possibly the photo still nagged at me. Enough was enough, and I decided to do what many of you also suggested, an honest talk with my mom. I got the chance to sit down with her over dinner. It was tough convincing her not to bring my stepdad, but with my girlfriend out for the night, I managed to convince her it could be mother's son time. Then I hit her with the question, do I have a sister? Her reaction wasn't what I expected, it was almost like she was glad. Why do you ask? I told her everything I told you guys. My memories, grandma's slip up, and I showed her the photos we took from grandma's house. She was silent for a second. That would be your half sister. She asked if I was ready and told me the whole story of her and my dad, filling over the gaps and, well, it's kind of shitty. 
My mom and I were a second family. My dad and half-sister's mom were married and were family friends. Dad cheated with my mom and the timing couldn't have been more perfect. My half-sister and I were born within a month. Mom knew we were on the side and continued to go along with it. And my grandmother would babysit both of us. This is the time where all the memories and photos came from. When I was about three, my half-sister's mom got wise to the truth and insisted her family move away and cut off all contact. Obviously, that's exactly what happened. Mom wasn't happy as she liked the arrangement and took it like a bad breakup. Mom and grandma were the only ones who knew who my dad was and decided not to tell me. In a bit of not shitty news though, he's allegedly been financially supporting us the whole time. Just a bit here and there, but enough to make my life as comfortable as it was. Then my mom told me their names. She wants to be left out if I try to make contact, but I'm not sure I will just yet. That's a personal thing to figure out, and I think I'll take my time. But some social media searching led me to my half-sister's profile. I broke down in tears when I saw it, because even 20 years later, I recognized her. So she's not my twin, but my half-sister is out there, and she's exactly who I remember slash thought she was. Thank you for all the support. I was really happy that the OP got an answer, but despite it being good news, this discovery somewhat complicates things for the OP. A user by the name and bearing R would explain this excellently. It's my fervent wish for the OP that it would be a happy reunion, if slash when he reaches out, but I'm concerned this process could be a bumpy one. Given that her mother insisted they leave the area and cut contact, there's a good chance that his half-sister has no idea about her family's infidelity, let alone that he had a second family. There's also no way to know without him asking why his father chose to not be present in his life for so many years, and hearing why may be challenging, even with the best of intentions on all sides. None of that is the OP's responsibility to manage for these people. In my opinion, he's totally innocent and entitled to reach out if he desires. However, walking into such a situation could be rough on him. My hope would be that he got some solid support behind him when slash if he reaches out. Having a therapist to help with thinking out this process and how to best care for himself through it can be really helpful. Just want to wish you lots of luck and say that I'm proud of you for pursuing the truth. This is true. The OP has no way of knowing if his half-sister even has memories of him or if she has any clue of the truth behind her parents' relationship. Contacting her and his father could open up a can of worms in their family's lives and possibly even reignite past grudges that the family tried to move past. This is definitely a lot to take in and a huge burden to bear for the OP, though I would assume that the OP's father and their partner must have thought of the possibility of this happening down the line. You can't just pretend like a person you brought into this world never existed and will never get curious enough to find out who their birth parent is. This last post was the conclusion to the OP's mystery, but the story didn't end there, because 11 months after they got their answer, the OP came back to the sub with one last and final update. Hey, it's the guy who thought he had a twin sister, but discovered he was actually part of a second family. It's been an interesting couple of months. Well, where did I leave off? Not long after I discovered the identities of my biological dad and half-sister from my mom, my stepdad sat me down. It was pretty generic. You're my stepson, yes, but you're a son to me stuff. Like I said in a previous post, he's a good guy, we're just not the closest. He looked like he wanted to say something else. However, he lingered, opened his mouth, then closed it. He left my room with a polite nod, and that was that. I didn't pay it too much attention at the time. Here's some important background on my stepdad. He started dating my mom when I was 12, and then got married when I was 15. Like my mom, he doesn't do any social media and holds a steady job. He's a middle of the road normal guy. I never thought he'd have skeletons in his closet too. See, I have my mom's last name and in a sweet move, my stepdad took our last name when they got married. I'm the one joining the family, he would say. He's one of the nicest guys I've met. More on that later. My mom told me a bit more about the arrangement with my dad when he moved away with his wife and daughter. She said that my dad supporting us financially wasn't as simple as him mailing a check every month, but she didn't elaborate too much. So, I have access to the names and contact information of my biological father and half-sister. They live on the other side of the country and seemed pretty normal. With a lot of nervousness and doubt, I decided to reach out. I'll spare you the whole process. A couple of texts, a couple of days pass, Dad and I have a video call, and then, when it seems like an awkward foray was coming to an end, how about I fly you out here? Lots of soul searching and mental preparedness later, I set across the country to meet my as I've been calling them, half family. I was shocked. My dad was like me, 
a huge nerd and collector. His wife was very nice and even took me aside one time to share that she had no ill will towards me and not even much towards my mom anymore. She apologized for being the one to keep me from my dad so long, but I let her know she wasn't to blame. And my sister. My sister and I have become best friends in the past six months. The headline here is, she remembered me too. She has several more memories than I. She can't remember the three thing, but she remembers the daycare at the indoor athletic facility and told me about riding the little battery powered four wheelers at grandma's. I remembered it as soon as she said it. We are twins and all but mothers. We've become pen pals, discussing our families and what our growing up experiences have been. And it turns out, it's a good thing I had her for support when what happened happened. I visited their home in the Pacific Northwest this summer when there was an insane heat wave. They have no AC in their home, so the house was consistently reaching 90 degrees. We're sitting around one night, my half family and I, sweating on the deck. The sun had sunk behind the mountains and we were sharing some beers and telling stories. Dad was telling a story about the day he skipped school while his brother went to school. And dad got away with it because his brother signed his attendance sheet. My dad's wife said, your stepdad has always been punctual. And my dad said quickly after that, yeah, we all know that, even you. We all kind of froze. My sister looked just as confused as me. My dad's wife stared silently into her glass and my dad sighed. Yeah, I didn't know how to tell you about this part. I was thinking he might want to. Here's the shocker. So way back when, when my half family left, my dad had his brother, my uncle, take care of the family, bring by groceries, and fix up the house. He helped us out a lot. And for the first decade of my life, he was kept distant from me. But then, him and my mom fell in love. I was a preteen when I was introduced to him as my mom's boyfriend. My dad was shocked by the relationship and cut off contact. So, my uncle married my mom when I was 15. Once I was sure everything was finally out of the blue, I think I was okay. My stepdad slash uncle and my dad don't really talk anymore for obvious reasons. I had an enjoyable rest of my visit, but dreaded coming home to confront my stepdad. Uncle? God, I wish you all could have known how I felt. Once back, I sat my mom and stepdad down. I know you're my uncle. Just like every other problem I've had over the past year, it resolved much more easily than I could have imagined. I begged my parents, all of them, to tell me everything I don't know. I'll keep personal conversations personal beyond this story, but for the first time in my life, I know everything about myself. I know it's messed up. I was part of a second family. Grandma forced to keep secrets, not knowing my real dad, or even the existence of my half-sister, and my stepdad being my uncle. But I've turned out okay. I'm in a steady relationship and have a good job, and I'm barely in my mid-twenties. I've learned valuable lessons from the mistakes of my loved ones, and I want to leave you with this. My parents have had the weight of the world on their shoulders for 20 years. In the past couple of months, we've found cathartic healing and a stronger bond than ever. Forgiveness is in the air. I like to think my grandma knew this would happen eventually. So don't keep secrets from your loved ones. But if you have some currently, approach the situation deftly and honestly. Times will be tough, but the light at the end of the tunnel is relieving. I'm not confused anymore. My family has doubled in size, physically and emotionally. For the first time ever, we'll continue to grow as one. And that was that. An insane ride. And I can only imagine the roller coaster of emotions the LP went through. But thankfully, everyone seems to have somewhat moved past this and no longer have to keep this family secret hidden anymore. Our last post was uploaded onto the RBI subreddit by a Redditor with the name of Those Damn Giraffes on May 24th of 2022. I'm looking for a news article regarding one of the most disturbing nights of my life. Story time. A long time ago, I was living in San Francisco. This particular night was December 13th of 2014. I clearly remember this because I was on the way home from work, taking the Muni and walking through Union Square to my apartment. Little did I know, it was the night of SantaCon. If you don't know, on this particular annual night in December, everyone dresses up in ridiculous Santa slash Christmas themed outfits and romps around the city. Seeing all the festivities and jolly people made me want to stay out later than normal instead of just heading straight home. So I sat in Union Square and called a friend to come hang out with me. Once he showed up, we decided to take a few laps around the nearby area to take in the sights. We walked around for a while, just talking and chatting up. As I walked ahead of him, 
I specifically remember him saying, slow down speed racer, you walk too fast. So I slowed my pace to match his. A few minutes later, I heard a strange noise, like a plastic bag caught on a fence being blown rapidly by the wind. I saw something above my head, and for a split second, my mind thought it was a bird. I will never forget the sound, like a cannon going off. I haven't heard anything that loud since. It took my mind a second to process that a body had fallen onto the pavement about two feet in front of me. The building above was somewhere around 40 stories high. Had I not heeded my friend's advice and slowed my gait, I may have not been here today. It was a woman. Thankfully, there was no blood. No big splat like in the movies. I could see the reverberations going throughout her body a few seconds afterward from the impact, and she was facing away from me. I think if I had seen her face, this would have been much more traumatizing. I remember she had tattoos and black hair. I looked upwards and saw a man leaning out of one of the windows of the skyscraper. He quickly pulled his head back in, and I tried to count the windows to find out which story he was on, in case he had been involved, but given the circumstances, it was hard to be exact. My memory tells me it was the 35th floor, but I couldn't say that number is reliable. Also, he could have just happened to see her fall and glance downwards. Now this normally would be considered a side. No mystery here. Nothing to solve, except for a few details. I clearly remember the sound of her falling. The weird part is that I realized later that she never screamed. This leads me to believe that she may have been unconscious. She was naked from the waist down. Now tell me if I'm wrong, but if it were me and I had decided on committing I would definitely have put on pants. Anyways, obviously my friend and I were extremely shaken. We backed up as some people started to call the police and it didn't take long for one of them to show up. They questioned us about the tragedy and I told them about the man in the window and what story I thought it was. Then, they sent us on our way. The next day, I went to the hotel. It was the Grand Hyatt near Union Square in San Francisco, and asked a concierge if he was there last night, and told him what had happened to me. I asked if he could tell me any details about what had happened, but the only thing he knew was that she may have been a transient, and that she had left her dog. Seems very strange to me that someone would bring their dog along for their final jump, but I've never been idle, so how am I to know? Maybe she wanted the company, also, if she was indeed homeless, then how could she afford a room in a nice hotel? My theory is this. Maybe she was homeless. Maybe she was a drug addict. It's possible she was even a lady of the night, as my dad would put it, and she was in someone's hotel room that night doing drugs and providing her services. But then she ODs. The person she was with panics and doesn't know what to do instead of calling the police. And, incriminating themselves, they push her out the window to make it look like a ride. Anyways. That has been my best guess. I have looked and looked for any sort of news article regarding the horrible night, because to this day, I still think about it and question what had really happened to her. I never had any luck. So it doesn't usually make the paper, but I was hoping the people of RBI may have better methods of searching. I tried posting this on Imgur a long time ago, since I wasn't really on Reddit at the time, and the only traction it gained was people calling me a liar. That didn't feel very good, so I deleted it. Now I'm trying again. I just want to know the story of the woman that almost killed me. I can't imagine what the OP must have been thinking, but seeing something like that happen right in front of you is definitely something that sticks around with you for a long time. One user, by the name of Cousin Strange, would offer the OP this advice. Hey, maybe posting this in a San Francisco subreddit would help. Suicides aren't always reported on, sometimes out of respect, sometimes out of lack of interest. If you remember the officers you spoke to, you could also try reaching out to the local PD and ask if there is someone who could talk to you about it, or if there are any records of it. The OP did in fact take this advice and cross-posted this onto the r slash San Francisco sub, which would lead to the first update from the OP in the comments of their original post. Update. A user on r slash San Francisco found the incident report. It states mostly what we already knew, but I do have an exact time now. We have our first lead. It ruled it officially as a suicide. Included was this image of the incident report that provided the exact location of where this happened. And this is the Google Maps street view of the Grand Hyatt Hotel where the OP saw the woman fall. Not long after this, the OP came back with a final and major update on the situation. Major update number two. 
On my r slash San Francisco post, one of the officers who was actually there and the one who wrote the report commented, all of my unyielding questions have been answered. It was indeed a suicide. I am so sorry for everyone who had to experience this firsthand, especially the woman herself. Thank you all for coming with me down this rabbit hole and assisting in my search for clarity. May she have found peace. The officer who commented went by the name Gizzard of Odd, and their comment goes like this. This is absolutely crazy, but I was with SFPD at the time, and I was one of the responding officers to this incident. I actually wrote the report regarding this incident. There was video evidence of her walking into the hotel with her dog, getting on the elevator, and going right for the open stairwell access. There were suggestions about drugs or a lady of the night, but ultimately, she seemed to have gone there with only the intention of jumping. She was a transient, but that does not take away from the loss of a young life. The image of her on the ground has never left me. I cannot believe this incident has resurfaced here. I am terribly sorry you had to witness that and hear that. In our interview of others in the area, everyone mentioned the sound, like a loud bang. Feel free to DM me if you care to talk about it, or if I can help recall any other details. Edit. I was so taken back reading your depiction of the night, I had wild flashbacks. I completely missed answering parts of your story, and I hope I can clear them up. No pants. The woman was wearing a dress slash skirt, which was still on her when she jumped. We believed that from the jump, the dress slid up, hence it looking like she was without pants. The last vertical column of windows are actually open air. We were told people would go to that stairwell and take in the sights. Allegedly beautiful view, but after the incident, I had no desire to check. I was told people would smoke there since it was open air, and although we never found the guy looking over the edge, it was believed that he was smoking on a different floor and heard slash saw the woman fall from above his location. The sound. She actually hit the metal slash concrete trash can as she hit the ground. The loud cannon-like sound was most likely the combination of her body hitting the ground at high speed and her head contacting the metal top portion of those dark green pebble concrete trash cans. She was not staying at the hotel. We had footage of her walking into the lobby, to the elevators, and out the elevators on one of the top floors. The timing of the footage meant that she got off the elevator and jumped quickly thereafter. A few sergeants were grabbing coffee at the Starbucks around the corner and may have been the ones to interview you. I will never forget the look in that woman's eyes laying on the ground. No one deserves to see that, and I am sorry that you were there for that. The OP responded back with this. This is incredible. When I wrote this post, I was barely expecting to find a brief news article, let alone the person who was there and actually wrote the report. Thank you so much for clearing up all of my unanswered questions about a night I will remember for the rest of my life. This has given me so much clarity. I had definitely considered that she may have been wearing a skirt that simply was blown upward since I can't remember her clothes at all. And now, I have confirmation. Although it's horrible and extremely sad in its own right, I'm glad this didn't turn out to be some nefarious act against her, but her own choice. I'm so sorry you had to experience this too. I can only imagine what she must have been going through. I hope she found peace. Just as the OP said, I too hope that woman found peace. I'm also glad that the OP was finally able to find closure from this memory that has haunted them for years. That's all for this video. Leave a like if you made it this far, subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one, and as always, Thanks for watching.